I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'll spare you the rest of that. Hey, everyone. Welcome. That was The Loop from Joe Restivo's performance the other day on that 65 Deluxe Reverb with his exotic XTC telly with those really nice Brandon Wound T50s. And I took that performance, which I had recorded in the looper, and I broke it up into six different segments that I can use at any time uh, with any amp for future videos. And I've got some other loops that I'm, I've started to create, and I'm going to be uh, seeking out loops from pros I know. And like I said in last week's stream, I'm going to be seeking out loops from you guys to be featured on the channel, should you like to participate. Uh, there's no payment, and uh, it's totally to help me out, but it's also to help everyone out. It's kind of thing of as for the community, so you can hear how different amps sound with different guitars and different players and different styles. More on that to come. Um, I'm working out the technical details, you know, 44.1 minimum, 720p minimum, if, 24 frames per second if, if there's video. We'll get to all that, but uh, enough about that right now. Let's start from the beginning, and speaking of the beginning, the first one I see is from Robert Hastings. I appreciate that. Um, welcome, Robert. Uh, always welcome, and I uh, hope, hope it lives up to whatever expectations you may have. Now, on my iPad, I can see that there are questions before Robert Hastings, but Robert Hastings, uh, hello to all here, is the first one that I see here where I can read it. I can't really read the earlier stuff. So anyone who posted a question before Robert Hastings, please copy and paste, and I will answer it. And I appreciate it. Thanks, Mark van der, uh, van der Linde. Thank you. Hey, Victor, aloha. Hey, Nola. Um, yeah, the, the uh, JCM2000 TSL and DSL, uh, sorry, DLS, no, TSL and DSL. You threw me off with your DS, DLS. It's triple super lead and, and dual super lead. So uh, one's got three channels, one's got two channels. They're the same output section. And crucially, they're the same bad conductive board that likes to catch on fire. Uh, so you have uh, two channels that catch on fire versus three channels that catch on fire. And you pay more for the three, three channel catch on fire version. Hey, K. Michael P. from Sebastian, Florida. Uh, hope you're doing okay there in Florida. Hope everyone in Florida and Georgia and the Carolinas has been okay um, with um, Adalia. And I hope everyone in Southern California survived that rare rain event. Uh, I know I'm not need to downplay it. You know, it was horrible what happened to people in Baja, California. And, and Mexico before the storm hit that cold water and, and cooled off. I hope everyone's okay out there. Um, and everyone in, in Hawaii, you know, my thoughts are still still with you out there in Maui. Um, terrible stuff. Uh, Natasha Tana's got an amp question here, so let's go to this one. This is probably pretty easy. The vibrato channel on my 75 Super Reverb stopped working on both inputs. Normal channel's working fine. What is most likely cause? What is the most likely cause? If that amp were on my bench, the first thing I would do would try a different tube in V2, which is the first preamp stage and second gain stage for the uh, vibrato channel. If that did not do the trick, I would then change out V4. V4 mixes the reverb in with the dry and gives a, a makeup gain stage and sends it out. So the most likely cause is one or both, in some cases, uh, bad tubes on that channel. If it's not a tube, the next thing I would do is look at the heater supply, make sure there's not a, a bad connection because um, you could have a, a bad solder joint where uh, pin four is connected to heaters, but pin five is not, but th that connection goes down to V1, so V1's heating, but V2 may not, or at least both triodes may not be heating. If that's not the case, then you start looking at cathode voltages um, so if you have that amp and it's not a preamp tube, um, if you can usually measure the heaters with the tubes out. You can just measure uh, AC present between chassis and pin 4, chassis and pin 5, chassis and pin 9. You should be getting 3 volts AC in each of those cases. You can do that safely from outside the chassis. If that's not the case, if, you have, if it's not the tubes and you have heaters, 
take it to a tech at that point, you need to look and see if a plate resistor has gone south or there's a broken solder joint somewhere. Just keep him talking till the sun comes up. Gandalf taught me that a long time ago. Hey, Emmett Otter. Uh, thanks. Uh, he's asking about does the AC15C1 really need modding besides raising the screen grids? Well, I'm going to do a follow up video on that because in that video, I was trying, trying to set all three apps the modded AC15C1X. <clears throat> the unmodded stock ACCH uh, and the much more expensive matchless Lightning 15, see if I can make them sound pretty much the same. And uh, I think they sounded pretty much the same in that video. The matchless has a little bit more low end, which you can hear here and there. I did turn the bass knob down on the matchless quite a bit compared to where the bass was set on the two Voxes because I was not trying to say, hey, this is what the two amps, the three amps sound like with the knobs at noon. I was trying to say, can you get pretty much the same sounds? The mids, uh, to my mind, to my ears rather, were a little uh, more open. Uh, the overall sound was a little less congested with both the modded C1 and with the matchless, because the modded C1 and the matchless both have the true JMI tone stack circuit. The stock AC15 has a fixed 10K mids resistor that does not vary depending on the treble and bass pot uh, uh, positions. So that had a little bit more of a boxy mids, which is not a bad thing, but it, and it's in that case, it was kind of subtle. I'm gonna do a follow-up video just comparing the stock and the modded. There are ways to set the tone stack on the Top Boost channel where you hear the differences more clearly on the Top Boost channel. But the Top Boost channel in the stock AC uh, 30 and AC 15 custom series is quite good. Where most of the differences in sound are, are on the normal channel. Um, the normal channel um, in the stock app has less gain and is much brighter. On the modded one, it has much more gain and it's not quite as bright, but it's not dark. You'll hear that in a second video. I also added a, a mid switch uh, on the Top Boost channel, which really transforms that channel. You've heard that in other videos, but that was not a fair comparison to the other two, which did not have the, the ability to do that. Um, then the rest of it's longevity uh, upgrades on the output to, you know, section to make sure that there's not going to be heat damage on that board and that EL84s will last longer. Now, the mods on those things are relatively straightforward. They're just a little bit time-consuming because you have to pull the board out and do very delicate work so you don't damage the board. I'm not saying there's any mojo to it or that it's necessary to have done, but it does make the amp respond differently. And if you listen to that video I did with uh, Steve Selvage with his AC15 C1, uh, his has the greenback, um, the normal channel was very changed. And if you listen to him playing straight in with the 335, he spent half the video just on the normal channel without touching anything. It was just it's really musical. In stock form, it's a little anemic and a little bit uh, too bright. So whether it's worth it to you, I cannot answer. But I'm not selling Fromel kits or promising you miracles or mojo or any of that. Besides, I only sell Grigri. Hey, Jeremy, thank you very much. I, I get asked this an awful lot, and I've, a I've answered this an awful lot. And I, I don't mean to be rude. I, it just, I don't want to repeat myself too many times. But basically, I was an English major, which meant that I could not afford to have anyone fix this stuff. And um, so I went to the library and got a bunch of books and started trying to fix my own stuff and kind of found I had an aptitude for it and an interest in, in how things worked. And I learned more and did more and tried more and burned myself more and zapped myself a few times and here I am. Uh, longer versions of this have been answered in previous live streams or in the Tone Talk I did with Dave Freeman last November. But thank you for asking. 
Yeah, Tellyman sounded awesome. Trouble with, with Tellyman is he's not just a Tellyman. He's his primary love is being a big jazz box man, and he has a great collection of arch tops from the '40s to now. He's got beautiful, beautiful things. I'll need to get him to bring some of those over here, and we'll feature those on the channel. Joe Restivo. Put it this way, he's one of the best jazz players in town. And this is Memphis, so that's saying a lot. He plays with all the greats. I mean, he, some of his bands, he's the only guy in that band under 70. So all the guys are still kicking who were this shit from the 40s through the 80s. He is still their guitarist of choice. Uh, he uh, played with, um, he, he's done so much work over at High Records. Uh, work, and working with so many guys from the from the High Records rhythm section, all the Hodges brothers, he's tracked with all the Hodges brothers. After after uh, Teeny passed, Joe's been kind of the, the guy. Um, but he you know so he does hardcore jazz, he does incredible R and B, blues, gospel, uh, soul, funk. Um, he's not too bad at the country stuff either. You heard a little bit of that. Um, Mo Funk Loops. I'll get more funk going. I'll get some funk stuff. With Joe, I don't tell him what to play. I don't feel that I am qualified to tell Joe Restivo what to play. I, I said, hey, here's your guitar. It's all set up the way we, you and I talked about. Here's a 65 Deluxe Reverb. If you don't mind playing for everyone, we'd love to hear it. And so he just played, and I just tried to move the camera as necessary. I should have moved the light a little bit, too. We had a bit of a video with a glare, but... I wasn't going to tell him, no, no, t stop what you're doing, turn back, because the camera isn't lighting. When someone's playing like that, don't interrupt him. I, I shouldn't, at least. You know, Miles Davis can tell him anything he wants, but uh, I I I'm not going to tell Joe what to play. So I'm not going to say, uh, do some funky stuff. Actually, that's that's a semi-lie. I, ha I have made some general requests. But I don't tell him, play this or play that. I'll say, hey, play something funky and wh whatever your funk is. I, I don't care if it's Parliament. I don't care if it's Muscle Shoals. I don't care if it's, you know, a Philly Soul. You know, let him choose what to play. But that, that's, that's as much direction as I've ever felt comfortable giving him. Thanks, Matthias. Let's see. Uh, Todd Janney, I will be getting to you this weekend. I'm, I'm trying to get stuff out so I can get stuff in with a clean conscience. I've got a Ampeg to ship. I got a Vox to ship. I've got two Deluxe Reverb there that are going out Monday, hopefully. I j the mattress just went home. I'm going to do a video on the uh, stock versus modded AC 15s. Then the AC, the modded AC 15 goes home. The stock one will then get modded. Um, and then I've got a 65 and a 66 Deluxe Reverb here, which I hope to have uh, uh, ready for prime time tomorrow afternoon. I'm going to try to get a video of those two. I might use some of Joe's loops through those, and those will be ready to go home. So, you know, um, uh, that's that, that right there is a lot of real estate. And then I've got about five other amps that are on, near to completion. And as amps leave, then I have space. For amps to come in, I don't want amps to sit here and not have anything happen for a while. I'm just one guy. So let's see. Uh, Carvins are, are not very good. And I'm sorry to tell you that. They're just built as cheaply as possible. If it's working and it sounds great and you're happy with it, fine. That is the very definition of, of a good enough amp. But um, they were always the next tier below PV. Uh, as far as quality. That's PV as it used to be, not PV as it is now, where it's all overseas, cheapest of the cheap. But um, Carvin's, I never quite understood um, how Carvin made what they made at the prices they made. Um, I've played their guitars, I've played some of their amps, I've been inside some of their amps. Um, I don't know, this, they exist too. Uh, and if you love your amp, that's great. I'm not not trying to shit on you or make you feel bad, but they're not really well built. I have to be honest about these things. They're better built than that very expensive Marshall uh, JCM 2000 TSL 122 I featured this morning. Hey, Bambi, he was talking about uh, Neil Young's sound on Cortez the Killer. Well, 
Um, I don't think he's using a fuzz. I think he just has a 5E3 cranked, and I believe that he's actually miking that and then running that into some larger cabinets as well. But a 5E3 cranked, um, the whole ugly distor blocking distortion, nipple distortion that 5E3s do, a lot of guys try to s skirt around that and just sneak up to it. Uh, great example of right on the verge before that becomes a problem be Carlton's uh, solo on uh, um, Kid Charmant, Maine. Charmant, yeah. Kid Charmant. I'm not going to pronounce it the correct way. Um, but Neil Young goes right past that, just dimes it, and it is what it is. And he's got weird, uh, weird microphonic pickups in his black uh, Les Paul, um, and he plays like him. So I think a lot of that is probably just that raggedy old deluxe. And he's got weird contraptions. I think he calls it the whizzer, where it's a whole bunch of servos that literally turn the knob on the amp. It's a box that sits on top of his amp that uh, responds to MIDI, and he can go from his clean sound to his dirty sound by literally having the knobs turn in real time. Um, so if you have a 5E3, turn it up. And if you don't sound like Neil Young, uh, well, then go play another 30 years on that amp till that speaker really breaks in and all the components drift in just a certain way. But uh, Neil Young's probably not, he probably has 20 old Tweed Deluxes and that's the one that he uses. Uh, they all sound a little bit different from each other as time goes on. Hey, Lee Arft. Um, how do I feel about it? That strikes terror into my heart because into my heart because I'm uh, absolutely terrible at things like that. I am not Martha Stewart. I am terrible at that kind of craft. Uh, I would say that if you really want to keep that baffle, uh, get a replacement grill cloth, whether they're new or aged, from Mojo Tone, and then find an upholstery shop in your town that can swap that for you, and they will do a much better job of it than I can. Or you can get the same, uh, you, you can get a new baffle with the grill cloth already attached from Mojo Tone and put that in your app and keep the old baffle if you ever sell it to a collector. I find that the plywood baffles from Mojo Tone, in fact, sound better. Now that's subjective, but I find that they sound better than the old MDF boards, that baffles in the old fenders. And it's also nice because the screws that hold the speaker in place tend to be much more solid on the new ones. And it's a direct retrofit, and then you can just move the logo. So when I have a guy come in with a broken baffle or effed up grill cloth, usually I just get a new baffle with a new cloth. And uh, I let the owner play around with coffee, grind, coffee grounds or whatever if he wants to age the cloth more. I'll just install it correctly, s solidly, transfer the speaker, transfer the logo, confirm there's no issues, and here's your amp, and here's the old beat-up baffle slash grill cloth. But there are guys and gals and service and companies that uh, replace grill cloth very well. I am not talented in that particular area. I don't do that anymore. I don't even attempt it anymore. Well, thanks, Tasty Tony says using loops for sonic dip, uh, comparisons is a great improvement. Fewer variables is always a good thing. It is good, except um, that was a clean clip with the uh, a cleanish clip with the boxes. If I were to turn the gain up a little bit more and say I'm playing into a really good amp and I play something and it starts to feed back through that really great amp, but I'm recording that in a loop. Then I play uh, that loop into the second amp. We're going to get that feedback out, out because it's, just, it's literally this signal going into the amp. And the third amp is going to have that feedback. Whereas if I'm really playing each amp, hey, this one feeds back, this one doesn't feed back, this one uh, feeds back better uh, in a nicer way than the others. Those are the variables that real time can show that a loop cannot. Because what if the, the, I play, record the loop in the first amp, don't get any great feedback, harmonic response, no real great, interesting overtones building up. And then I play that loop into the second amp, and the second amp would have been capable of showing us that, but because there's no interaction between the speakers and the pickups in that situation, we don't get that. So loops are great for what they do for, as far as consistency. 
uh, and removing playing variables, but they they also remove the existing app variables. Now that's one of the reasons on those Vox videos, I was doing them in clean, semi-clean stuff where you're not gonna hear that difference that much. If I were to do each of them with a volume at one o'clock and just hit a big D chord and let it ring, you'd hear very different responses from each amp, despite the fact that I might be rotated in a slightly different position with the guitar. But if I loop that, you're just gonna get the same sound back and whatever interaction between speaker and guitar was there will be there on all of them. So all these things have to be done in moderation. Hey John, L, the Matchless uh, is um, essentially just the top boost channel of an of an uh, AC30 paired to a 15 watt uh, version of the AC30 output. It's not the true AC15 output with the uh, choke before the plate on the output tubes, but neither are the Voxes. They're all 15 watt versions of an AC30 as far as the output section goes. Uh, the other differences: the vo uh, the Matchless has a crossline master volume like the Voxes, but does not have a, a cut circuit. So it's always a little bit brighter than a Vox. It's over filtered to my ears. So it means it's a little bit stiffer, has a little bit more low end, but kind of a harder low end. And it has uh, the main difference between the matchless Lightning 15 and the Vox circuits um, is that the uh, matchless has a 1.5 nanofarad coupling cap coming out of the top boost channel versus 500 picofarad that you find in the Voxes, which is what you had in, in JMIs. So it, it's an octave and a half or two octaves more low end response, which actually can make it kind of muddy uh, and, and blocky distortion-y with higher gain. I'm not a huge fan of the, the match, matchless amps, but people people like those sounds, that like those differences. Um, it does not affect uh, the sound, if you know what you're doing, but the, the matchless has the uh, tone stack pots wired back backwards like the JMIs did, whereas the modern one, ones have them wired forwards like all Voxes from the TBX forward have had. So clockwise is brighter on the treble and bass, whereas the JMIs actually worked quite differently and the taper is very different. So you, to get the same sound, you have to have very different o'clock positions. But that's just a peculiarity rather than a, a real difference in the circuit. Hey, PF, I appreciate that. He got a Mojo Tone 2204 kit. Uh, yeah, I've, I've shown uh, how I like to do Marshall builds uh, on, on grounding. And, and I don't know if it's in my tech tips playlist or my um, Marshall playlist or both. But I've also I've shown 2203s and 2204s where I have deliberately changed uh, the grounding on those. Uh, look, so, so look for my uh, grounding video specifically on Marshalls and then look at every 2203, 2204 video I have out here and don't use the bus wire. Don't use that bus wire across the back of the pots. Look at my videos and because you know that's probably like two hours total of really, really showing you and describing it, the why it works to you. I can't repeat all that right now. But uh, you know, hit me up if you have questions after you watch those videos. And, and always go slow and check your work. And um, you know, when building an app, get the output section working first. If it powers on and there's no surge and, the, and you have, have a bias and all the output section looks good, then bring in the output tubes. Can you bias them? Is that all good? Then bring in the phase inverter. Is that section working well? Don't build the whole thing and then power it on because if one thing's wrong, you don't know where that's wrong. But if you get to the point where, all right, it powers on, the bias is good, I've got correct voltages, here's the phase inverter, and if I put a temp in a jack feeding the input of the phase inverter, I do get signal. You know that from here to here is good, and then you do the next section of the app, and if you have a problem, you know the problem's in that next section of the app. That's not just for Marshalls, that's for every build until you really, really know this stuff like the back of your, of your hand.
Oh, Clyde, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an entertainment lawyer or, or trademark lawyer. I would say that many of those guys have not uh, exercised any responsibility in those, in those regards. But that's, um, that's in industry sniping, which is outside my level of expertise or my area of expertise. I may have opinions, but they are not based in having worked on thousands of issues. So I'll rag Marshall DSL and TSL amps and Blues Juniors and such things, but I'm going to leave product endorsement stuff to uh, the attorneys and such and marketers. Hey, Vinicius. I'm very glad to hear that. It's such a, it's such a nice sounding guitar. It's, um, you know, I never thought I'd love an SG, but I do. It's just a, a beautiful sound. And I suppose if you wanted to play real hard rock, it, it'll do that too. The, that's not my bag. But uh, it's, it's a lovely thing um, that Batman would love to. Hey Tim Connors, I'm trying to work on that, but it's been a been a tough financial year and a half, and uh, more to come. Hey Lefty Mike, V1 is the first valve. It's usually the first valve in the signal path, and it's also you. Pardon me, pardon me. Usually the first valve, the closest valve to the input jack. That varies a little bit from amp to amp. It's not the case in an AC30, a JMI, for instance, but it is the case in the modern uh, custom and hand-wired series. Um, yeah, a head is typically a, uh, the combo flipped. Uh, so it's not a matter of left or right. It's a matter of closeness to the input jack, typically. There'll be variations where that's not the case. In some maces, they will label the tube which is closest to the input jack is V1, but the first uh, tube in the signal path may actually be V2. So there is no logic to this. It's, it's a convention which is not always adhered to. It should be. It'd be nice if whenever someone said V1, we all know that that is the first valve the signal comes to. It's just not always the case. Hey, terribly bad guitar covers. Uh, you asked me about my opinion on quality of orange amps on like EL84s. I have, I've, I've answered this pretty thoroughly um, in both my amps under a thousand dollars video, and I did a, a podcast with um, Vertex Pedals uh, about a month ago, and I discuss my issues with uh, with oranges. There, I'm not a huge fan of them. Uh, as far as longevity, repairability, and reliability. The sound is quite nice, but s seek out um, the Amp Center Thousand Dollars video first, because I show some of this, and then I did a follow-up um, amp discussion on the Vertex uh, 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 Pedals channel about a month ago, where I go into a little more uh, depth about the oranges as well. Hey, Wes, if I don't call you out by name, hey, everyone, I'm glad to see all of you. I just noticed that Wes was a little bit late coming in. <laughs> just saw your Jimmy Buffett content. Um, Silas B., man, this kind of question gets asked over and over again about the 64... Uh, hand-wired Princeton and the hand-wired Deluxe. And every time I answer the same, they're, they're, they're scams. They're, they're, they're promising you a quality which does not exist. In fact, the opposite is true. You're much better off buying the 65 reissue, less expensive version. They're still not inexpensive, but they they do cost less than the hand-wired. For the price of the hand-wired Princeton or Deluxe, you could get a real 70s Princeton or, 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 or Deluxe. You get a, a used... Uh, you get a new Cerebella, which is a much better amp. You get a used Top Hat, which is a better amp. There's a lot of stuff which is better than any of the the uh, the fenders that have been made since 1980. Um, but 
if you want the sound of a Princeton and you're looking to spend twenty four or twenty five hundred dollars, get a seventies and have it restored. Don't waste your money on the the hand wired sixty four series because they're they're they're. It's not like they hired really smart guys to make that one, and and you know it's not like it's the same gang of women back of the old fender plant putting their names carefully on masking tape. It's just it's just stuff slapped out as fast as possible, and uh, sounds like it. And thank you for your thoughts about the channel. I appreciate that. Hey, Nick, speaker recommendations for 66 Pro Reverb. All right, if the SC64 are a little or too dull for you, you probably find the Creamback 65s and the ET65s also a little a little on the less bright side. All three of those speakers, the Creamback 65, the ET65, the Alessandro uh, GASC64, are designed to be full frequency response with lots of mids, lots of lows, and quite a bit of highs, but not glassy highs. But uh, If you find that that sounds dark to you, it could be, you know, make sure that you're you've tr trying with some different amps just in case there's something wrong with your 66. Just in case. Tr plug some different amps to those speakers. Most people love the SE64, the Creamback 65s, the ET65s, Probably 80% of what you hear on this channel is, is the ET65 on my shop cab, and it's really similar to the ET65, sorry, to the Creamback 65. And they're not dissimilar in a lot of ways from the SC64. But if you want the more traditional Fender sound, uh, then I would recommend the Warehouse WGS G12C, which is about the closest thing made today to the old Jensen C12N, which would be what you find in a 66. Um, certainly in, in a, a, a twin uh, and often in a pro, though some of those might have had Oxfords or something else. And that's going to be the more traditional glassy uh, Fender sound, but they don't necessarily take overdrive and fuzzes as well. I describe the difference to people as if your ideal Fender clean sound uh, would be like Stevie Ray's uh, Riviera Paradise. G12C all the way. If your clean sound is more of the Robin Ford kind of thing, then the Creamback 65, ET65, SC64 is more of that. Remember that um, Robin Ford was playing distortion and, and clean through the same app. Stevie Ray would change between Marshalls for the dirty stuff and uh, vibra verbs and such for the cleans later. Earlier, he was using a, a super reverb for the dirty, dirty stuff, and that sounds awesome too. I, El Macombo, um, yeah, you, the amps are there. It, it's just the player. Hey, Maz Greg, uh, modifying a tube guitar amp to be a harp amp. Uh, usually it's the same thing. But you just want to roll off a lot of highs because harps are prone to feedback and people like a dark thing. There's a company called Little Walter. Terrible things inside. I mean, just really bad. But all that thing is, um, I don't remember if it's a 5E3 circuit or whether it was the, 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 the Tweed Princeton circuit. It's been a while. It was one of those. They're very similar circuits. And all he'd done was add a great big cap to ground uh, where the tone control would, would be. So it just dumped a bunch of highs. You know, like, uh, I don't remember if it was 10 or 20 nanofarad to ground. And it just... So it was useless for guitar, but other than that, it, there were no changes. Um, if I get an amp for a harp player, I don't do that too much, but for the ones I have done, I, I will usually add a, either make sure that the, the like I can take a, a tone circuit in a 5E3 and a push-pull pot, which takes it, the treble cap out of the 500 pick ferret, so you can get the guitar sound, it gets brighter and darker, or you can uh, pull the thing out, and it'll disconnect the bright cap, and it'll add another cap in parallel to the dark. So as you roll it down, it really rolls off the highs. That gives that harp roll off. And then I'll often incorporate a negative feedback removal switch for that, uh, for the guys who really want to sound like it's an old Helen Wolf uh, Chicago thing where the uh, record uh, is distorting the, 
the microphone on the recorder. Though, if you're using like a, a sure bullet, that's that's a lot of that right there. But most harp amps are just low wattage guitar amps with the, the whole bunch of high end dumped off. Hey Matthew, I'm glad that worked out for you. Yeah, those those mods I put out on the forums for the custom classic, for those unfamiliar, were, were fairly basic stuff. You know, it's like take those hundred k plate resistors and change them to two hundred twenty k because it's supposed to be a Vox, not a Fender. Um, the bright cap was way too bright on those, so let's bring that from one hundred twenty to sixty eight picofarad. Um, to way too much output going to the EL eighty fours. Let's Decrease the value of some coupling caps. <coughs> Pardon me. And then let's bump up the screens and grids on the output tubes so the output tubes last longer. Uh, not a lot of uh, over-promising, but a lot of just, hey, let's engineer it to be a little bit closer to what Vox used to make. So I'm glad that worked out for you. Um, Supros are pretty much garbage, though. Um, changing next one, we're... Uh, the the only uh, mods worth it for a Supro, like the Blues King and Tone King, if you actually give it real input and output jacks and make sure all the hardware is tight, it, it's a hell of an improvement. But it's, it's still, you're, that amp is going to die on you down the road. Uh, if you have a Supro, I rec you know I'm talking current production in the Zinke era stuff, uh, not 60s. But if you have any Supro made in the last 20 years, try to move it while it still works and, and don't buy them. They're, they're really insultingly poorly made and have nothing in common other than the, the print with a Supro. If you really want the sound of a Supro, you wanna to go to Mitch Colby, my buddy Mitch Colby uh, up, in, up, up in New Jersey. Uh, well, he has the Sun Dragon series. Uh, he had the limited edition all signed by Jimmy Page, but he had a, a standard production. And that's the real Supro that you want, and it's built right. The uh, limited edition was all new old stock, hand selected, blah blah blah. The uh, current, the regular production line is still really high quality stuff, just not, you know, quite as uh, made to order, and without the Jimmy Page signature. So also quite a lot less. Infinitely better apps that uh, are real Supros, but they don't say Supro. And also check out his actual, his, you know, his other company, which is Colby Amps. Uh, I think he still owns Park as well. He might have sold Park, but he was making Park and Colby and the Sun Dragons. I think he might have sold Park to focus more on the Colby, but he's a brilliant guy. He's been in the industry forever. He was a, a VP at Korg at, for Marshall and Vox. He knows industry. He knows amps. He's a really nice guy, really gr great player, and his wife's an incredible artist, and I'm glad to call him a friend. So if you want a Supro, you can either find <coughs> – pardon me – let me get some, some, some besides coffee. Something from the 60s and have a guy like me fix it. Or you can call my buddy Mitch Colby and get a brand new one that's better made and better sounding than anything ever put out by Supro and Valco and National and such. Or you can buy something new that says Supro and just throw your money away. Hey Clyde, I have no experience with uh, the Explendor, but Top Hat does great stuff. Uh, I have mixed feelings about Two Rocks, but I have not had that model in, so I don't have an opinion on that. And the Fuchs ODS, um, I have some differences with the way Andy does things, but the end result is a really good sounding amp. Um, I, I, I have not had every one of those on the bench if they're all around 1800 i don't think you can go wrong with any of them i think you might go more right with one of them so play them and see which one speaks to you uh, any one of them is going to be well designed good sounding and serviceable so that's all you can expect from an amplifier um so let us know which, if any of them, you choose, but play them first. You will know. Hey, Zealot, uh, you have a question about replacing the 
reverb tank, but I don't see a question. But yeah, I, made by beautiful girls under controlled atmospheric conditions. I remember those. You can still get tanks for JC120s. They just won't be made by the, uh, the folded line company. So there's no assurance that they were made by beautiful girls. Uh, but, you know, they do work. But I don't see any other question other than just the general thing. So if you have a more specific question, um, uh, I will come to it. But uh, Antique Electronics, tubesandmore.com does sell a wide range of of, uh, of uh, MOD and other tanks. And if you look under MOD and look under the, uh, um, it's going to be one of the E series, whether it's 9E or 8E or 4E. Those are the, one of those is going to say JC120. You can you can Google that. There's some if you Google reverb tank JC120, you'll find the part number you need. Thanks, Clyde. That's very much appreciated. Thank you, Matthew. Huh, Olaf Kromps. I'll have to. T I'll, I'll just have to look for that. Thank you very much, Joachim. Let's see. Travis, you are describing most likely. Uh, he's got an AC15C1. It's quite the reverb off. When he turns the reverb on, there's a hum that gets louder as he turns up the reverb level. It sounds like you're describing a broken reverb tank. That's the most common thing. It could just be a disconnected RCA cable or less commonly a bad RCA cable, but... Uh, those are great amps, but they ship with the same crappy belt and Accutronics reverb tanks that Fender uses and all their stuff, and they're just terrible. Um, sorry, I was looking over to see if that was my wife about to come in the door. I heard it in the hallway. Um, those belt and tanks are garbage. Get an MOD, get a... Uh, I guess uh, for that, it's a solid state. It's one of the E series, not one of the A series. Um, um, so you, you get... Uh, uh, MOD is going to be your best bet. A huge increase in quality over the uh, uh, Belt and Accutronics. And then, then you ask, should I replace the reverb tank first? Yeah. Uh, or at least disconnect the reverb tank uh, and see if the hum goes away. You'll still get a buzz if, if you turn up the reverb with no tank connected there. But it's, you know, if it goes from home to bzzz, you'll know that the, the difference is the tank. Okay. Ah, now we're now to sell Zealot's question. He's sorry. He got he got the he got the Belton uh, A B. Shouldn't I don't think that should be an A B. I think it should be an E. You've got an eight A tank. That's 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 usually got the impedance for the uh, for a tube driven and the JC one twenty was. I'm almost sure would use an 8E, E meaning that the, the, the impedance is going to be correct for a solid state. I may be incorrect about that, but um, as far as mounting it, it can be tricky. But you'd have to, uh, I would, let's see. You could transfer the mounting holes from one tank to the next. That might be a problem. You probably have to drill. Let me Google that for you real quick. Just a second. Let's see. JC120 replacement reverb tank. Yeah, I'm not. I'm seeing. Um, early models of the JC120 is A. Uh, I'm pretty sure it should be the E for most of them. Let's see. I know this is a great, great, a great video for everyone. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of uh, 4A takes for that. Maybe they did something. Uh, Maybe Roland was, uh, I've not replaced the tank in one of those, I don't think. Maybe Roland was saying, well, every tank out there is designed for tubes, so we'll do a solid state circuit that has that impedance. Um, as far as mounting it, you may have to get creative and mount it somewhere else in the amp. Um, I 
the last times people have brought me JC one twenties and JC JC seventy sevens and such, I have declined them. Uh, I don't think I don't think that they're um, a good use of people's money these days. I think they were a phenomenal, ground changing thing in nineteen seventy eight, and have uh, gotten cheaper and, and poor, more poorly built since then. But it's it's a loud, clean amp with no headroom, with a kind of interesting chorus sound that you can't really adjust, and a kind of not great reverb and a, a really bad overdrive. And if you play it even on clean, you play it too loud, it's going to break up. You can get uh, the same and better sounds out of a katana for a third the price, and then you get like fifty other sounds too. So I'm not. I, I don't recommend that people fix their JC 120s or put money into them. So I've not seen one in a while, and I'm sorry to. Yeah, you know, feel free to ignore this, but I, I just don't think that's an app to put too much money into or time. Hey, Alex, appreciate that. I, I have no thoughts on the new Rev D20 uh, with the two-note tech built in because I have not played one or seen one or had one on the bench. Um, if one comes in, I'll be delighted to, to find out about it. Um, I am not an amp reviewer channel, as in when new amps come out, they're not sent to me. I'm not... Uh, getting stuff from manufacturers to put up, you know, review on the internet. Neither am I buying stuff, reviewing it, then flipping it, which are the two ways you see most people. Ah, the coffee fairy is here. Thank you, my love. Most YouTube guitar music review channels are either people who are getting stuff uh, to review. Sometimes they, they keep the stuff for free. Sometimes the stuff gets sent on. Many times. People doing the reviews are paid. And then there's guys who just want desperately to do YouTube reviews. So they will buy something, review it, and then sell it. And some, sometimes they lose money, sometimes they make money, whatever, um, just to have a channel. I'm not either of those things. I will occasionally bring in an app that's that's available to show, like I did on that the first Friedman and I did on, on the sewer where, hey, I, I could bring this in and show you guys, but I didn't buy it and I was not sent it by a company. I was not paid to do that. I just did that because I thought you'd be interesting, interested. Everything else I review is an actual amp that comes in for repair. Now, when it comes to companies like Rev or the new PRS, whatever it is, or the new Marshall, whatever it is, <coughs> I have refused to be an authorized service center for most of the large companies because they don't pay jack shit and I'd have to spend all my time doing paperwork and life is too short uh, to, to partially repair something because the company will not uh, approve the actual repair or let me tell the owner that, oh, the, this is because this board's absolute shit. Um, so I don't play that game. So when amps come out and they're new and they're under warranty, they don't come to me. So that Rev, is, if it's new, it's gonna be under warranty. Now, if Rev, if you see this and you have someone in Memphis or the area who has one of them and needs service, I'd be glad to take care of it for you. I do that uh, kind of uh, um, unofficial for a couple uh, unofficial warranty uh, center for companies that I like, you know, whatever. But uh, until that app is out of warranty, it won't come to me. So it goes. It has a problem. It's going to go to Rev or whoever they have designated. Three years from now, five years from now, whenever it's out of warranty, if it's something wrong with it, it might be brought to me. In which case, I'll learn about it. So, um, in one respect, I'm always two years or so behind the curve on new products. But you know, I have an awful lot of amps since about 1948. I do have experience with that, so I think I'm doing okay. That was a really long, wandering answer. Sorry, but um, I hope that the revs are great. I've not had any revs in and I've not heard any revs in, in, in person. I hope that they're phenomenal. Bent Tom, that is not true. You can get cloth on there with a staple gun easily. To get cloth on there pr professionally, to get it straight, to get it tight, is more to it than just stapling it. You gotta uh, have um, um, you have to have a method to your bad madness. You need to be able to stretch that out and get it exactly parallel and have it under tension at the moment that the staples are applied. 
if you want it to look like it did coming from the factory. And I'm not trying to be mean to you, but you know, I've seen a lot of guys out there who think it is simple, and I've seen with their work, and it, it just looks like crap. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just mount the tank on the floor of the of the cabinet and get longer RCA cables because there's no need to going crazy for that. Let's see. Well, Randy, I have done a few videos like that. He says in these chats, questions come up that you respond to something like that would take me a whiteboard an hour to fully explain. Would you consider doing a few videos like that? I have. In fact, I watched one this morning that I'd forgotten about, and it's called Fender Tone Stacks Beyond Analogy. And it's only like a 20 minute video, but I, I did take the time to draw up schematics to narrate and explain uh, how tone stacks work in, in Fender guitars and to an extent uh, in guitars. And I've done videos on uh, the Marshall Randy Rhodes that came in where I show how it was designed, you know, the, 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 the one wire mod and all that, and you know, how Marshall did it versus how it might should have been done and what the benefits are and what's actually happening to the circuit. So from time to time, I have done videos on that like that, but I will say that I'll notice that over a year, that video kind of video might get 5,000 people looking at it. Whereas, Hey, this blues junior fell in peanut butter. will get 5,000 views in one day. So, you know, the more in depth stuff does not necessarily, uh, reward me. So, Peter Von Baller, thank you very much for getting my reference last week to your name. I was, just, I was like, I'm, you know, I could probably reference Molly Hatchet and everyone would know it, but I, I go cool like that with some skilo, and uh, I'm glad you got it. So, merci. Uh, tweed basement, uh, you don't need to use uh, insulated jacks. Just do it just like Leo did with Switchcraft uh, 12As and tighten the hell out of them with some tooth washers. Thank you, Instructor Gomez. Make an SLO head. Um, I can't tell you because I don't know what the ch if the chassis and cab are available to for that. Uh, you know, it's essentially just a Marshall thing. But to build a hundred watt Marshall style thing, which is what a, an SLO is, oh, thirty five hundred to, to four thousand. There's a lot of time involved in that. I mean, I could do it, but I think most people would say, I'll just buy a Soldano. Because when you make more than one of something, each individual thing gets cost less. If you make one thing, it can be quite expensive. Thanks, Bent Tom. I appreciate that. And also, you getting Skilo. Um, you know, like, like I said about the upholstery, I'm not trying to argue with you or make you look bad, but maybe, maybe your skill level is just really high. Most people will make an absolute cock up of grill cloth changing with a, with a staple gun. There's a lot to it, um, a lot of steps. And maybe you've just done this so many times it seems easy to you, but it's really hard for most people. I, I You know, I can't even knit a do doily, so. Hey, Gary, um, usually the only issue with a, with a warped eyelet board in a fender is uh, the horizontally mounted re resistors, like the slope resistors, the 220K in the vibrato circuit, and then the uh, 100 or 47 ohm in the uh, phase inverter to ground, those will pull out if the board warps. And the rest are usually running more on the uh, the non-warping uh, plane. But if it really bothers you, what you can do is you can take the board um, and remove the three screws and literally soak the hell out of it with um, 
isopropyl, in which point case the board will get a little bit soft, and then press it down and maybe figure out a way to put some weights in specific areas to hold it down while it dries and let it sit like four days, you know, either somehow clamped down a little bit, whatever. And as it dries, it'll take its new shape and that'll buy you some time. But I've only had to do that once on one board uh, just because it was really extreme and it was ripping where the screws were. Um, other than that, you just replace the horizontally mounted resistors with some new ones which have some slack. So instead of having it be like, let's see if I can show this. So instead of having right, you know, the resistor lead going into the eyelet and then right across, and here's the resistor and then down, you'd have it do gentle curves up in the air with a little excess. So it's like shock absorbers built in. The resistor would be here and a little bulge here and bulge here. So if this moves, that, that lead can move with it a little bit and that one can move a little bit. Yeah, Bent Tom, Seriotone does good stuff. I just never find that they really finish it consistently perfectly like that. 2203 or 20, I guess it was 2204. Um, I had to fix some relatively major grounds in that thing. But, you know, 95% of that amp was really good as it came in. It was just that last 5%. Only thirteen likes. Well, uh, that you might that might be from when you started watching Peaceful Warrior. A lot of times, um, the likes are higher than you see at the time you're seeing it. But I do appreciate the thought. Yeah, um, SLO, real Sodano, the stuff uh, Mike was making, phenomenal, phenomenal stuff. And any, if you're if you want something to be a tribute of a of an SLO, but you don't want to pay that kind of price, look for something else because a cheaper SLO is when you end up finding yourself with a fifty one fifty or a dual rectifier, which is just a total rip off of the SLO design, done really poorly and and done cheaply. Uh, I don't mean cheaply as in um, cost saving for you. I mean cheaply as in cost saving for them and shoddily. Ah, thank you. Thanks, uh, f uh, Fred Federici. Ricci. Uh, yeah, like Ben Tom saying, the fifty-one fifty sounds similar because it's a it's a, a cheap as ripoff of a Soldano, but the, the Soldano is is uh, much much better built and sounds a lot better. Hey, Martin, yes, are mercury magnetic transformers worth the cost? Probably not to you. Um, mercury has weird pricing. When I buy mercury, I'm, I'm buying dealer pricing. So my price on a mercury transformer is sometimes the same, sometimes slightly more than a Haybor or than was a classic tone, all of which are more expensive than Hammond typically. So when I choose a transformer for a company, um, and I might use a Mercury, you know, let's say it's a, a, a Vibroverb output transformer, and say the, the Hammond's $95, the Classic Tone was 115 the Haybor is 120 and my price on the Mercury was 130 That's that's then Then I choose whatever I think has the best build quality or whatever, or sometimes just availability. So if I buy that thing for $130 and I sell it to you for $130 and then I charge you installation, that makes sense. But if you were to buy that same output transformer off Mercury's site and it was $220 versus $130, my price, and so you're looking at the $230 output transformer versus the $120 hay board, it makes no sense for you. So I pass my, I get savings on those, which I pass along to customers. I don't play the retail game. I'm bored. I don't care about that. So from my perspective, if you see an app that I build that uses Mercury, there's a choice there. Often it's because I'm like, okay, this gives me the choice of taps that I want, or this one gives me the voltages I want. A lot of companies, if you have a, a Marshall 50 watt, they sell a 50 watt output transformer and they sell a 100 watt output transformer. That's what they offer. With Mercury, I can say, hey, I want one, I want one like they did in 67, uh, but this other guy has one that I want more of the 69 thing. 
there are differences in, in, in how they were wound. And they, they've reproduced a lot of different things. So it's not just like it's a 50 watt Marshall. I'm like, it's a 50 watt Marshall and, and X. So there are times when it makes sense for me to choose from my customers in Mercury. And there are times when I'm like, hey, that Hammond's going to be just great. Um, but from your perspective, it's probably not worth it. Uh, which is better for metal, EL34 or 606. You won't hear much difference. Most most metal amps have just tons and tons of, of preamp gain, and the output is biased so cold, you're not going to hear much difference. I think we're going to take a seven-minute break, and then we're going to get to some important stuff like good Memphis brewery recommendations. Bent Tom's go-to amp is a 1971 100-watt super lead which means that we can trust his taste, but not necessarily his ears anymore because they're probably gone in service to that wonderful, wonderful amp. And you know I'm kidding you a little bit, Bent Tom. That's a, that's a fantastic amp, especially if you have a stadium to play it in. On that note, we're going to take a seven-minute break, and I'll see you guys all back in a little bit. And uh, here we go.
Look, Ma, no hands. This thing's fun. I'm going to enjoy having the ability to play loops. All right, so I meant to do that earlier, and I always forget. I need a producer. I need someone to do that kind of stuff. And uh, if anyone's done Super Chats that I've not seen yet, I'm seeing things in the order they come in. I get notifications that there are one. If I scroll down to find it and put it up here first, then I I don't necessarily um, get back to where I'm at. The the big channels where that whole thing you know just pops up. Someone else is putting that on the screen for someone talking to read, and I'm I'm trying to catch up. If you if you do a super chat, I 100% will answer you through this. Uh, but again, uh, I don't require that people do a super chat to get your question answered. So I try to get through as many as possible. Good Memphis Brewery recommendations. We have got um, uh, High Cotton, which is quite good. I like their, their Scottish Ale a lot. Um, uh, there's uh, Memphis Made, which is really nice. I like their Fireside. Um, I think those are the two biggest ones. Um, if I'm missing one, I'm sorry, Memphians. I'm not a huge, huge beer guy. I don't like I don't like IPAs. And uh, the got to get up to get down, I find too sweet. Uh, it's you know, so I I have my my preferences, which go towards uh, dark, non as, as obnoxiously hoppy ales. So the Scottish ale and the and the Fireside Amber are what I like. But there are a lot of very popular ones here. But uh, Memphis Made and High Cotton, I believe, are the the two biggest ones. Hey, ASD, what is my opinion of the Friedman Dirty, Dirty Shirley? I have not had a Dirty Shirley in, and I have not played one in person. I have had a number of Friedmans in, and I know how his amps are built. I know how Brain's uh, noggin works. And I imagine that for certain players, the Dirty Shirley is fantastic. Other players looking for higher gain amps might prefer one of his other models. That's why he has several different models. So check out the Little Sister, check out the Dirty Shirley, check out the Pink Taco and all the other um, um, uh, amp model names, which I personally would be a little bit embarrassed to say what I have, but people like that stuff, brown eye and, and such. Uh, this, whatever, Whether it works for you or not is going to be a very well-built example of that particular thing. Just make sure that that particular thing is the particular thing that you want. Let's see. Hey, Danny. Uh, read a Swart amp spec saying high class A biased AB. What does that mean compared to normal AB biasing? I'm not sure what they mean by that. I would have to have the amp in, in front of me. Um, I imagine it means that they're pushing it towards where it just begins to approach class A, which can be possible. It's rarely done, but maybe Swartz pulled it off. They seem to, he, he really seems to know what he's doing. Uh, but with ha without having it in front of me, I cannot, I don't want to speculate. And the last week's live stream I referenced at the, uh, in the, in the, um, in the description, I put a link to Randall Aiken's excellent article on class A, class B, class A B, A B one, A B, you know, all these things, and how those work. I mean, it's 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 uh, almost a chapter of a book worth of information, and for me to try to summarize that here, uh, uh, both would do the topic an injustice, and I'd probably misspeak uh, because um, I'm I'm off the cuff and I don't I've not prepped my notes so. Uh, favorite EL 3484 tubes. Right now, I'm having good luck with um, uh, the Tube Amp Doctor Red Base series. Hopefully, that continues. Hey, Chris McKinney, glad the recap went well for you. Dropping resistors measured between 113 and 114. Uh, you probably mean the plate resistors? As in a hundred K measures 113, 114K, that's, that's, that's 13% or less ab above. I mean, you know, that's, that's still within spec. Unless you ha hear noise or an odd behavior, that, that resistor is fine. If you mean a plate resistor, there are no, 
dropping resistors that would be between 113 and 114. The dropping resistors in a Deluxe Reaper would be a, a, a 1K and a 10K for a 66. Avoid the Rivera era uh, fenders. Not as much as you should avoid the Zinke era fenders, but the Rivera era fenders. Paul had some really great designs that Fender's production at that time just totally messed up and made horrible. Um, really complicated. Doesn't sound very good. Uh, spaghetti wiring. It's, just, it's a bad era. It's not as bad as the Zinke stuff that followed, but get a 70s Fender, not an 80s Fender. Hey, Daniel, I used to like Chorus. I have not intentionally, uh, I, I would not play with Chorus now. I, I find that that has worn its, out its welcome. I showed a video of, of how to get a Chorus sound from a delay pedal in a pinch. And if I needed to use Chorus, I would probably just do it with a, a modulated delay like that. But um, I don't find Chorus as interesting now as I, as I used to. And I used to use it all the time. I never turned it off. It was just an always-on thing, which I think was a mistake. Um, I like Univibes better, and I like uh, harmonic tremolos better. Just a, a very subtle harmonic tremolo gives a similar effect, but it, I think prettier. And I like Leslie effects an awful lot. But any of those things can be overused. Hey, Joe, uh, sorry to tell you this. Never buy a Fender Pro Junior. They're even worse built than the, than the Blues Junior. Uh, they're just, they're really, to me, they're an abject insult to those for whom that is the best, you know, seemingly the best option they can afford. It's, it's like Fender has set out to, and Vox has done it as well with the AC4C1 and the AC10C1. It's like they're out to punish people with small budgets. Um, rather than get a, a Pro Junior, in that price range, get a Boss Katana 50 Mark II. You're going to have a better amp. It's going to last longer. And it's not, you know, a Boss Katana is not going to last forever, but it's going to outlast a Fender Pro Junior. Someone's inevitably going to come in, I've had my Fender Pro Junior for 20 years and never had a problem. Congratulations, you're very lucky. Uh, that's not a statistically meaningful sample size. And when you repair amps and you see the same model with the same failure over and over and over again, and the uh, average cost of repair approaches or exceeds the retail, the resale value of the amp, that tells me what I need to know. Hey, Boston guitarist, I would never choose a 6505 for reliability or for sound. The uh, Rockefeller Mark III is a better built amp than the, than the 6505, but they sound very different. And I, I'm not a huge fan of the, I'm, personally, I'm not a huge fan of the sounds the Rock Reverb does, though I think it's, it's, it's overdrive is better than its cleans. Uh, I think there are better amps than either in that price range, but I certainly would not choose a 6505 unless, unless I absolutely wanted that gent thing with the 5150, you know, the 6505 is just a tweaked 5150, you know, after uh, Edward split from PV and went to, Defender for the amps and uh, PV, uh, not PV, uh, started, you know, uh, Wolfgang guitars with Fender. Uh, PV had an amp design that they could no longer call 5150. They changed it 6505, and then now it's morphed a little bit more. But I want to, uh, I want to, uh, oh yeah, Emmett Otter's damn Mondays, everything's closed. Crap. Uh, well, um, I forgot. Uh, happy Labor Day weekend, everyone. Um, I forgot. I've totally spaced the, the time. Uh, so I would choose the orange over the 6505, but I would not choose either if there was something else to spend my money on. Hey, Jeff um, Mizai. Uh, Sir and Freeman make great stuff. The PT series is phenomenal. Uh, all I can say is if you find the model which suits your need from either company, you will never have any regrets. <clears throat> but, you know, you have to be aware that they make 
uh, different flavors. So don't buy the chocolate if you're a vanilla guy and vice versa. But they make phenomenal apps and they're good people. Hi, David Filler. I assume your question got cut off. I'll find it in a little bit. Hey, Rick Barron. Uh, yeah, Rivera amps, I think they're good. I mean, they're so much better than the Rivera designed Fenderers. Not every voicing choice that Paul made is a voicing choice I agree with. And um, I have some reservations about some of their models because they'll use a specialty pot which is not available any, from anywhere else. And that's how the, if the amp does not have that specially push pull dual gang pot, whatever, or push pull pot, uh, some of the functions aren't available anymore. And it's really hard to retrofit a different pot because they made choices to use very specialized components, many of which Rivera still has in stock and can sell to you, but not all of them. So uh, I think uh, uh, between that and some. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the solid state reverb circuits that some of them have in their tube models. Uh, I'm, I'm being honest. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of any reason to, to dissuade you. But other than that, they're built really well. I, I just think if you have a problem with a bad pot, you may not be able to get the amp 100% uh, or at least re and retain the Rivera knobs because uh, of D-shaft stuff. So there are some downsides, but... Odds are, if you find one and you like the sound, it, it's going to last, may need to be recapped eventually. Um, they're well-designed amps, and Paul's a very creative guy. I just don't agree with all his voicing choices, but that's purely subjective. And I want you to know that when I mention the the objective stuff, I'm, 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 I really mean it as objective. And when I say, hey, I don't like the sound of that because it's just not my cup of tea, that's wholly subjective, and feel free to disagree. When I express opinions about how amps are built those are opinions uh derived from a lot of experience more and more time with more amps than most people get to have when i express an opinion about how everyone should play or uh what uh, a, a a deluxe reverb should sound like uh for a certain genre th that's just like my opinion man it's the same as your opinion or anyone else's opinion well maybe not maybe that's a bad example i, I know what a deluxe reverb should sound like but um you know i'm not going to tell you what picks to use i'm not going to tell you what strings to use i'm not going to tell you what color guitar to have or how to style your hair Hey, Matt. Yeah, the Jupiters, I believe, are relabeled WGS. I'm sure WGS is making them to a slightly different spec, like the Fat Boy speakers. Fat Boys and Jupiters are WGS, and Magnetone is using the G12C uh, labeled Magnetone in their apps. They're, they're really good speakers. Hey, Otto van uh, Fledermaus. To fly the mouse. Thank you very much. What, in my experience, be a tweet app that doesn't cost much? All right, you're a student, love to have a 5v3, but it's out of your reach. Any suggestions? Thanks. Well, don't worry about tweed versus not tweed. Um, and it's ironic that a, a 5v3 Deluxe was designed to be one tier above a student model in Fender's original idea. Find the app that you can afford that sounds musical and make music with it. You can always add a pedal to a clean app to make it sound dirtier. It doesn't have to sound exactly like any classic app if that would strain your budget. Um, I don't know where you're located or what your budget is. If you could ring in with that, I might be able to give you more specific advice. I would say that the average really good player can do an awful lot with a Princeton reverb reissue and like a a a, a boss uh, not blues breaker. What's the little blue overdrive pedal they have out? You know, uh, it doesn't take a lot if the player is there. You know, Joe Restivo sound great playing through that sixty five uh, deluxe reverb. Uh, the next day or two, you'll get to hear him playing through these modded sixty eights without any pedals. He's still gonna sound great. It's still gonna sound great, even though it's a uh, uh, 68 
reissue the whatever that I've I just made not so bad as it came from the factory rather than an actual 65. I don't know who the first person used the resonance knobs. I think I first saw it on uh, 5150, but I think um, um, some other high gain amps had started to do it. Did Soldano do that? I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I don't know who did it first. It's, it's always been kind of an, an obvious thing to do as far as how frequencies work. And maybe someone did it back in the, in the 40s and I was just unaware of it. There are a lot of interesting uh, feedback and cathode tricks that have been done over the years. It's really hard to remember who did what first <coughs> or to dial that circuit in for, for a specific use, especially to come up with the concept of, of calling it resonance. Hey, Johnny Moondog, that's a big question. I've answered it a few times before. Um, too much is made of carbon comps on certain, in certain parts of the internet and other parts of the internet. Uh, too many people uh, just say that they're abjectly horrible and noisy and you know just make it sound like the worst thing ever. Meanwhile, people A are telling you they're the best thing ever. Um, see my videos on Fender restorations. Just as, in a nutshell, if I get a 63, 67, 65 Fender in, I put in carbon comps in the part of the board where this audio path was. I put in different resistors for the power section and bias supply because that's where carbon comp is weakest. Um, that's you know the place where I would ever, never, ever use a carbon comp in a power supply is exactly where Marshall, I mean Mesa, does use them. If I get an old Vox or old Marshall, I will usually use carbon films, except for some very early and transitional Marshalls that did use carbon comps. It, it's, a, it's a particular sound, and there, there are trade-offs to everything. I've answered this uh, long, at, at length in other live streams, and I've addressed this in individual uh, vintage Fender repair videos. As to which part of the circuit do I like them, I've given some specific examples, but anywhere where there's a good voltage drop across the resistor and voltage is present, you're going to hear the differences more than you will in a cathode where it's like 1.2 volts or in a grid leak where there's no voltage. You could build an app with 90% uh, carbon film or metal film resistors and then just use a handful of strategically used carbon composites where there is actual voltage present and you would get the benefit of the carbon comps while everything else would get the benefit of the noise reduction. So it's not like I love this thing and not this thing. I like using things for their strengths and avoiding their weaknesses. Yeah, Carlos Leon, sorry. Avoid Fender Vibro Kings, they're absolute garbage. Uh, this might be on my Facebook thing rather than the YouTube thing, but a guy had brought one in and it was just ground loop city. The entire, th it's, it's a zinky design and it was so bad. Big white heavy duty grounds everywhere, none of which were intelligently done in huge loops. Uh, dual gang 500k linear pots for everything. Some of them wired in, in parallel to give different uh, values. Just the cheapest of the cheap. It's insulting. All they did was incorrectly strap a Fender 6G, whatever it is, Fender reverb circuit with the wrong uh, driver tube, with the wrong voltages uh, in front of one channel of a super reverb, and they got the input impedance wrong on the super reverb and just guaranteed to have noise and buzz issues. I undid all that. It cost the owner an awful lot. He got a great amp, and at the end of it, it still says Fender. So someone looking at that and hearing that amp would say, my God, that sounds great. I'm going to go buy one. Then they get the same piece of shit that Zinke uh, foisted on the market. So I don't do that anymore because it, it will lead people to make bad decisions. Uh, yeah, please please don't buy a, a Vibro King. You're going to see so many reviews saying they're great, the best thing ever, and, and how could what, what's, what's wrong with that loud guy? He, you know, he, he's got to be wrong. Most people doing gear reviews out there either have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to amplifiers or they're being paid to review things for you. And they see a $3,000 thing that says Custom Shop Vibro King, and it looks pretty. They're going to tell you it's great, and they're going to realize 
you know, they can hear it, they can play it, and it'll be noisy, and they'll still say, but I mean, that's the price you pay is vintage. No, vintage amps aren't noisy. There's a big misconception. People think vintage amps are noisy. Vintage amps have never been uh, had any maintenance done for 60 years will be noisy, but they were not noisy when they were built. They were not noisy when they were used on those great records, and they don't have to be noisy today. So uh, I find the Vibro King and all the other custom shops from that era just to be... Um, as bad in their own way as the, the Marshall TSL and DSL hundreds, which catch on fire, or the Blues Juniors that catch on fire, or the Hot Rod DeVilles that catch on fire, or the Pro Juniors where everything breaks because it's made of plastic. God, I sound negative. I really never wake up in the morning saying, well, "What can I shit on today?" I'm like, I hope something good comes in, you know, and I'm gonna make that DSL TSL one twenty two work. And these AC-15s, I love being able to say, hey, this stock AC-15 that you can get used for 500 and new for 7 or 8 sounds as good for this use as this $2,000, $3,000 matchless. I like it when I get to point out, hey, not everything in this world is, is gloomy. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, right. Um, he's designing an isolation box for his Reverb Deluxe, Deluxe Reverb. Partial box covering speaker grill and rear. Oh yeah, you, you don't don't do that. You're gonna have n massive airflow issues and cooling issues. And if you're doing a partial box, you're not gonna get uh, blocking. If you if you want an isolation cab, buy a pre-made isolation cab with an eight ohm speaker and a place where you can move the mic inside it. I think uh, various channels show that. I, th I think uh, Rhett Schulz got some. Um, Tim Pierce just has a shop in uh, a place in a room in his garage below his his recording room but you know you can run a, a deluxe reverb out into an isolation box and disc you know bypassing the internal speaker you don't have any issues at all but a partial solution will just be that it won't be worth the cost materials and time as far as your results i'm sorry to be negative but I, if i can save you some time and money i will Hey, the vintage Club 20s are great, Matt Price. For the price point, they're fantastic. Uh, you know, the only things to look out for on those, you know, like any PCB amp uh, where things are mounted, you know, the pots are mounted to the board, you might eventually need to reflow some sockets. Um, you know, it's from the 90s, so it's approaching, you know, it's 30 years old at least. It's probably time for a recap. All the, all the uh, electrolytic caps in there should still be available, mostly radials. There might be a couple of axials. You can still find the axles for the uh, cathode bypass caps. Just be careful working on a PCB, learn how to do it. Uh, if you want a less harsh, uh, cleaner sound overall, um, standard stuff, look at what's in there and what, you know, like if they have a bright cap, is it 220 picofarad? Try 100 picofarad, um, stuff like that. But this stock amp sounds pr quite good. Uh, they have, should be chock full of red Wema film caps, which are really great. What is my opinion on the Fender Cyber Twin? Well, that was the app that was going to change everything and render all other amps obsolete. And they're not on the market and haven't been for a long time. And if you find one and one of the little servo motor controlled pots goes bad, sorry, it's going to cost more to repair than it you know, ever costs new. It was a uh, it was a gee whiz, look what we can do kind of thing. It never sounded great, and uh, cost of ownership would just be ludicrous. I, I would avoid them. Uh, and you don't need a twin reverb that changes its knobs for you. Get a real twin reverb and, and play. Just get a real twin reverb and a good guitar and sit down and practice. And I know that I'm rusty and I've got arthritis and my playing's not great, but that's why I'm, I'm featuring guys like Jervis Tivo and St Steve Selvage and, and Logan Hanna and, and Hal on here. I mean... Proof's in the pudding. I get the amps ready for the great players, but any of the great players would take a, a standard Fender Twin and knock our I mean, all our jaws be on the floor, whereas a Cyber Twin, the, the great players would be like, that's not quite right. Something, what? Why does it do that? You know, the best thing I can do for a really good player is make them forget about the amp. And with a Cyber Twin, you're always gonna be thinking about the damn knobs and the the black box on stage behind you. Jeff, no maces are good. 
Some are worse than other. None are good. Hey, Rob F. I'm on your TV. I'm famous. I'm on the TV. Have a good day, man. Enjoy your practice session. Thanks, PF. Let's see. Ah, uh, good. Uh, no, uh, it might have looked the same from your point of view. Uh, the Rivera is infinitely better built than the Mesa. Um, I've got the 100 watt version, or had recently the 100 watt version of that same uh, Rivera that Brad's got the 50 watt version of. No comparison. Same kinds of parts inside, used much differently. So I don't mean to say, you know, I'm not trying to publicly correct you or anything, but no, it, it's. It's so much better than Mesa. It's just a crime. Uh, let's see. Nin, I'm not answering your question on Morgan Apps because I've already uh, caused enough of a stir on that. But see my Morgan videos. on Those are specifically on the PR12 and PR30s. I've not had some of their other models in, so I cannot give an opinion on Morgan Epps, but I can, I've can. i already given, um, not opinions, but just observations of fact about specific Morgan models, and I was appalled. Hey, uh, there used to be a lot of different options, but different tubes were designed to do different things. Uh, some were designed for broadcast use, some were designed to uh, power the, the, the your television or your stereo, of the kinds of tubes that we use in guitar amps, there have never been an infinite variety. There used to be much more than there is now. But certain ones became uh, very popular. And as a designer, it's difficult to remember how to use and all the differences between 37 different um, possible preamp tubes or 42 different power tubes. Basically, at some point, once the uh, twin triode uh, format that gave us a 12AX, a 12AU, 12AT, a 12AY, uh, 5751 came out, well, that just made so much sense. You can say, all right, it's going to be a standard form factor, standard heating requirements. I know what the current draw is going to be. I need something that does voltage amplification. Here are my choices. I need something that does... Uh, current amplification, here are my choices. And then we had, uh, the, the uh, once once the power of pentodes came out, so it's the 6L6, uh, EL34, uh, 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 you know, all these things. It's like, oh, this is so much better than the other one. I mean, if you look at the difference between a 6L6 and a 6L6 GC, the GC is the later version of that. And I'm like, oh, it gives, I can handle more wattage. You know, it gives me more wattage. It can handle higher plate current. It's, you know, costs the same. This makes so much sense. So all of a sudden, within the musical industry, it's like, okay, we're going to work around interchangeable tube types. Um, so I could put KT66s in this. I could put EL34s in this. I could put 6550s in this. You know, there, there are things you have to bear in mind when you make those changes, but you're init- you're, you don't have to use different sockets for them. Uh, there's no wild variation between the design for six L- V6s versus the design for 6550s. Nothing's weird. There's no nothing where like, oh, I can't remember. You know, we got to find out that one guy who knows how to use this. So that's why we're pretty much uh, down to the usual couple dozen suspects. And now today, you know, the only ones that are still being made are the ones that we use. Hey Dave Fuller, your your Greenbacks take overdrive pedals great. You probably, and I mean this nicely, probably need to learn how to um, uh, sweeten up your tone stack settings. Uh, if you mean that it's getting fizzy from overdrive pedals, or or is it getting uh, mushy with overdrive pedals, an AC thirty C two with Greenbacks will take pedals excellently if if the preamp controls are set correctly. If you make that amp real, really bright, and then you turn on an overdrive pedal, it'll take your head off. Or if you have 
a lot of gain dialed in to the preamp, and then you add more gain from a from an overdrive pedal, it's just going to turn to mush. So um, it's not going to be the speaker. Now, a different speaker will, will sound different, but as far as an overdrive pedal goes, if you can't get good overdrive sounds using greenbacks, something else is wrong. I'm, I don't mean to be... I don't mean that as in a flippant or dismissive way. I mean, I'm serious. You need to spend more time with your amp and learning how to uh, adjust that tone stack. And the tone stack on, a, on AC30 is very much unlike the tone stack you may be more familiar with with Fenders and Marshalls. Hey, Rick Barron. Another question about Rivera. I've answered Rivera questions, I think, twice already here. Thanks, Maz Greg. I don't have Rusty, but I've got Bella. She's she's in our lab, but she's too smart to be in these things. I wouldn't use a brown box on uh, new amps unless I had uh, unless I did not know that the wall voltage coming in would necessarily be 120. If I'm if I'm playing situations where the wall voltage may be 127, 130, yeah. A brown box or a, or a, a universal power supply or a very very act just to make sure that the wall is being the amp's getting the 120 it was designed for can be worthwhile. Or if I have an old fender where hey I need this thing needs to get 112 volts so that the uh, the heaters are in line and and the and the bias is correct it can be worthwhile. But the brown box is one of many options. The very act is probably the the best option, but it's going to be the heaviest and largest. The brown box is small and convenient. doesn't give you as much fine tuning, but it, uh, it's small and it's lightweight. It is very expensive. Universal power uh, conditioners uh, uh, for, for computer use are kind of large, not very expensive, and you're going to have a choice of 120 or 110. That's it. It's fixed. And it's not going to have the current capacity for all amps. You won't use that with an SVT, but for a deluxe reverb or a 5B3 deluxe, sometimes that $90 uh, universal power uh, supply f for a computer is great because it's whatever the wall voltage coming in, comes in is, it's going to give me 120 or 110 out depending on the setting. If that wall voltage drops, it's going to give me that f until the battery wears out. If if the battery goes up, if the sorry, if the wall voltage goes up, it's just going to charge its battery. So there are a lot of good options, including the brown box, but it's not the only one. It's a very convenient one though. Let's see. Some guys are asking the same question again that I've already answered the first time. Uh, um, every question will get answered as I can get to it, I promise you. Uh, Tail Wheeler, thoughts on the Mason Mark 7? I don't, I've not seen a Mark 7, but I see Mason Boogie there and I know what it's going to be. Mason Boogies are garbage. I don't mean to be mean. Yeah, Belton, it is sad that the, uh, uh, John Williamson, it is sad that Belton reverb tanks are so bad because the, the tube sockets are so good. Uh, I'm sure that they're different factories and just owned by the same parent company. Hey, A. Joseph, 86. Of the tanks on the market today, he says a 68 uh, Princeton reverb having issues with the reverb. What tank do I recommend? Of the tanks on the market today, I most like the Mojo Tone Medium Decay. Not the Long Decay, it's the Medium Decay. And the Medium Decay Mojo Tone sounds both in duration and tonality more like the old Gibbs Accutronics uh, Long Decays from the 60s. And I like the Surfy tank, Surfy Industries tank, as far as the sound, but it is built exactly the same way as the Belton Accutronics, which is to say... It's a, it's a garbage bill that they charge $70 for because they're having Belton make them to their spec. And it's a small, relatively small production run that Surfy is ordering. So I feel sorry for Surfy Industries because they're trying to make something that sounds good. But because they're a small company to get to the market, they have to have Accutronics make it. So it, it's $40 more than their competitors. It doesn't sound um, necessarily $40 better than the Mojo Tone medium decay and it's probably going to last 40 times less because it's still made by belt and accutronics to some really crappy levels so i hope that surfy industries is able to get their tanks made um, either at a much lower price point in the future or made by a different company so keeping the sound they're going for but with a higher quality 
Um, so uh, beyond, so next level will be MOD, Ruby, TAD. They're all the same tank, as far as I can tell. And way, way, way down on the list below that is current production Accutronics Belton, which I wouldn't even bother with because the 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 bad Accutronics is twenty five bucks. The good MOD is twenty seven bucks. Get the good one. Thanks, Gam Jam. Let's see. Let's see. Boston Guitarist is a good idea to buy lower wattage lunchbox versions or go to the high watt versions for repairability. I have not had any lunchbox. 800s or 6505s, but I imagine that it's going to be even worse than their larger versions. Um, the only lunchbox amps, and this is a broad category, and I know that a lot of new additions to the field have been coming in the last year or two that I've not played with. The only ones in the lunchbox form factor that I would ever recommend, and I don't really recommend them, it's just I don't recommend against them. I would, you know, the Victory amps are really well built. Uh, every other lunchbox, st lunchbox style amp I've seen has been really poorly built. It's going to have real, real repairability issues, and especially when you get something like a, a, a tinier version of the amp from Marshall or a tinier version of the amp from PV, and they've not been making good large versions either. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Um, plus, you know, the the real sound of a of a, of a 2203, 2204, 800, or uh, a Saldano, if you want what the 6505 and 5150 are pretending to be, or the what the uh, uh, dual rectifier is pretending to be, that big, big, powerful output section, you know, like a 100 watt Saldano, sounds different than a 50 watt Saldano, which is going to sound different than the 30 or a 5 watt. Um, so you, you know, there's no free lunch in this. Um, I would go for the best sounding, best built amp you can afford, and. I, I intrinsically missed, uh, have apprehensions about baby versions of big apps. Some, something's going to, something has got to give. So um, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, yeah, that's the sound of a great big 100 watt raging thing. And this is the sound, pardon me, this is the sound of this little thing that's kind of uh, you know, dying to give its all. Uh, I'd rather have very different sounds uh, than a generic approach. You might as well just, you know, before I would buy a, a lunchbox version of a 100-watt Marshall, I'd just say, fuck it. I'm just going to go get an a, a HG Stomp or a, HX Stomp or whatever or, or a Katana. And just say, it's it's going to be close enough that people at the gig won't care and it saves my back. Hey, Tony, I've not had a, a catalyst in yet because they're still relatively new. They're going to be under warranty. Uh, I've seen the insides. They're built pretty much like the Katana. Neither is built especially well. Um, but the thing is that they cost so little that if they last five years, they've pretty much done what you expect them to do. You know, they're going to last as long as a cell phone. Um you get another one. By the time five years has passed, it's going to be obsolete anyway. There's going to be a newer, better digital amp out. So, for what they're trying to do, they're fine. And I've mentioned this in other amp, in other videos. You know, for that same or more money, you could get a, a, a what's that awful thing called Black Star HT Club Forty, which promises so much, but it's built just as poorly, and it's just as disposable. But it was never. Uh, the premise was never that it was going to be disposable. If you're getting to a Catalyst or Katana, you, you, you know what you're getting. It's going to be really good at certain things. It's going to probably be, be good enough. And if you get it to last five years, that's you know, it's a $300, $350 amp. That's $70 a year. That's That's cheap. That's nothing. If it lasts 10 years, you've won the lottery. But odds are in five years from now, there's going to be a new version of it. And it's going to have more op op you know, more options and you know apps that work with it. You're going to want to upgrade at some point. It's just a different game. Let's see. Let's 
Let's see. Sorry, I'm trying to catch up. People are talking to each other. And hey, Paul. Yeah, AC15C1s get hot. Most amps get hot. Um, won't hurt a thing. They're designed to do that. Tubes are quite happy at temperatures that will quite literally burn the hell out of you. And the metal does not get fatigued from that. And the metal panel will not get distressed from that. And the wood handles it just fine. You're not going to have any issues running that thing hot. Unless you smell or see smoke, you're fine. Ceramic is what you'd find in most of the, the old ones. And ceramic, um, I like the sound of in a old AC30. The, 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 difference between the, the difference in sound between ceramic and silver mica can be relatively minor. And so if there's a weird value, like a, you know, like there's a 750 picofarad in the um, tremolo circuit on the, on, on the AC30, if you can't find the value in a, in a silver mica and you get a ceramic, you won't hear any difference that one thing, or vice versa. So you find, sometimes you find the cap with the uh, uh, value and, and voltage rating, and you don't worry about what it is as long as it's not leaking. Um, you know, but in general, I find that the, the ceramic, um, cumulatively has some distortion and, and, over, um, overtone characteristics that I prefer for the AC30, but it does not mean that an AC30 built using good quality silver Michaels, micas is going to sound bad. It's just going to sound slightly, slightly different. Machete the Android, I was asking about Supros. I answered that pretty thoroughly and negatively at the beginning of the stream. So go back and watch from the beginning. I don't mean to, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just trying to uh, not make this too repetitive. Hey, Eric Houston, if it hums to the speaker before taking the amp out of standby, it's, it is a, often a problem. It's usually a sign that uh, uh, there's a field from the power transformer which is being induced into the output transformer. Um, typically means that the two transformers are too close to each other and or on the same axis. So that's n When an amp's in standby, you should hear nothing. Uh, but the trouble is if, they're, if you're getting that induced hum, that's always going to be there whether you're playing or in standby and it's going to cause... It's going to interact with everything that you play. That that noise is not a good thing. Sometimes the solution is just to rotate the output transformer uh, 90 degrees, and sometimes the solution is rotate the power transformer, depending on which one mechanically is more feasible. But it's uh, if you are auditioning an amp whether to buy it and you get that condition, just walk away from it. Let that be someone else's problem. Let's see. Hey, Dustin. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to get in touch with the guys at Rev. Um, you know, uh, uh, I, I think they're probably making fantastic amps based on what I've heard and the people who are playing them. Uh, I would love to be able to say, yeah, Rev are the shit. Everyone rush out and buy a Rev. But I can't say yay or nay based on what I've seen on other channels. I would have to have one in front of me. But yeah, I'd like to check one out very much. So... Maybe that could happen. Hey, David Pekarski. I have not worked on the Bogner XSC 100 watt in the 6L6 version. I see. I've had a whole bunch of Shivas. For some reason, the Shiva has been very popular. I've had some alchemies. Had some of that awful thing that they did with, with Line 6. That was a bad joke for both companies. Um, I've had an Uber shawl. I think I've had an XSC, but I don't remember the particulars. So I, I, that's all I can tell you. I'm not a huge Bogner fan, but I understand why people like them. All right, Mint Tom's replying to my comment about stretching grill cloth and applying change of grill cloth. Um, he's yeah, he, he 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 was saying how easy it is. And I'm like, it really isn't. And he's saying here, he's done over 100 of them and forgot 
you know, yeah, it makes experience matters, but I bet he's not just pulling it and stapling it. You know, the way the guys who really do this, they, they take a bar of wood and wrap it around the cloth and they pull that wood flush and then they staple it. So that sometimes it's a two person job. Sometimes there's a frame set up to, to really help out with that. And sometimes if you've just done it enough, you know exactly what to do to get re- re- results. But it, the, the first time someone does that, odds are they're going to butcher uh, that. Baron, Baron, thank you, Simone. I don't think I sound like Ben Stein, but uh, I, I will take the uh, almost compliment that continued in there. Saludos desde Argentina. Hola, de Biru. De Biru. Uh, uh, and then you got a, you've got a tilde that I never encountered in high school Spanish. So is it Ribasu? Ribasu? I don't know if that's, see, I don't, I don't know what to make of that tilde. Um, sorry. I, um, I, I, it's it's odd. I can read menus, and in Spain, um, I was there briefly, and I can and I can read the signs, but I can't understand the spoken Spanish there. I, I took high school Spanish, which was very basic Castilian Spanish, and everything I learned in that class, if I try to use it in the Hispanic parts of Memphis. The, the, the Spanish speaking parts of Memphis. Basically, everything I would say would, would sound translate to forsooth, forsooth, good sir. Which the thou be so kind as to beat the hell out of me now. So I, I just I, I just stick to trying to uh, say please and thank you and hello politely in my my relatively poor Spanish, and uh, it's 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 tough. I, I wish that the Spanish that was taught in high school had any relationship to the Spanish that is actually spoken in North America. It's such a huge gulf. Even even verb forms are different. And uh, But hola. Bienvenido. Best year for Princeton's Clyde Broadway wants to know. Uh, 64 through 69? I have not found any manufacturing faults with the Runt 20 yet. Um, there was one resistor that he changed in production, um, and I have seen varying degrees of soldering sk- skill on how that change was implemented by um, the uh, production facility, which is BAD. Um, but it is not a crippling thing. Uh, but I have... I have reservations with some of BAD's stuff. I don't have reservations with Dave's stuff. Um, but the the one thing I'm, I'm mentioning, I maybe even shouldn't mention it because it's such it's it's less it's not likely to be a problem and it's easily repaired. Um, uh, more impre- you know the only thing I would say is a problem of manufacturing fault with the Runt Twenty. This is stuff that Dave made me and everyone aware with, where they had a bad batch of the uh, of the uh, ARS caps. And every one of those that's been affected by that, he has handled, hey, there he is. Hey, Dave, he's handled as warranty. So he's really been proactive about that. And and, it was not his fault. He got a cap from a manufacturer in large quantity that said it was made to X spec and did not hold up to X spec. And he has been uh, making that good. So that's not a real problem with the Freeman Wright 20. That's more in the shit happens and what do you do next? And... Dave did the right thing next. And I started that sentence before that I saw you were here, Dave. So anyone wondering if I'm, I'm sucking up to the guy? I never suck up to Dave. I'm much taller. Hey, Seth Everhart. Yeah, uh, well, Top Hat is great. Um, matchless can be good for some people. See the video I put up yesterday showing the ma- the matchless Lightning 15 versus a stock and a modded AC 15 custom series. You know, so maybe the AC 15 custom does it for you. It's a used $500 amp, brand new. It's an seven $800 amp. But yeah, the top hats are really, really good. Um, 
They cost quite a bit more. They'll probably outlast anything that Vox is currently making. As good as the current production ones are, there's something about the simplicity of the top hat. You know, the one I had in recently, I recapped, uh, but you know, it, it was built in 2007, so it, it got recapped, what, uh, like 17 years into its life. That's that's, and it was a it was a it was a preventative recap. Nothing in there had exploded. Hey, Joe, um, if you're looking for a really reliable tube amp under 1K, I, I, would, I would need to know um, what sounds you're trying to get. I, I, I don't want to recommend something that does high gain to a, a, a jazz player or just cleans to a metal player. Um, I'm 6'2 uh, barefoot. I'm 6'7 in heels. Hey, yeah, right. Uh, so what? Uh, don't, don't. No one needs to have attitudes with each other, and I'm not, I'm not singling you out. But yeah, I mean, you. All right, yeah, right. You're getting a little bit ugly there, uh, Dustin. Uh, Dustin might as well be my spokesman as far as this goes. You know, you answer ask the same questions many times, and I answered. Well, the first time I came to it, but I came to it when I came to it. And I'm not trying to start a fight, but you guys don't need to snipe at each other. Dustin's trying to uh, make it easier for me where I don't have the same question over and over again. So, and, you know, he's really trying to help me and arguing with Dustin about this doesn't help anyone. So your question is already been answered by the time I get to this. Well, Lawrence Cash, um, depending on what volume you're running at, you may not be, may not really be hearing the any of those output sections for metal. A lot of guys doing metal are running um, a lot of gain in the preamp and keep the master kind of low. In which case, you're just hearing an output. So, uh, in general, I think that for most metal players at stage volumes, yeah, you're going to prefer six hundred sixes or thirty uh, fours uh, because the the transient response and the bass response is going to be much faster uh, at lower volumes you're not going to hear necessarily much difference so that's a really interesting question thank you for your, your comment um how much role do tubes play in the show well tubes play a huge role but it's not the only one and magical um, qualities are ascribed to output tubes uh, in a lot of cases, I find, because um, say someone has played uh, only Fenders and really good Marshalls, and they have very different output transformers and very different speaker cabs, very different negative feedback structures, and very different uh, uh, phase inverters. And so th the Fender has a certain response. Uh, the Marshall has a different feel. To that player, the only real visible difference from the outside is, oh, that's what 6L6s have. Therefore, 6L6s sound like this. That's what EL34s, that's what this one has 34s, that's what EL34s sound like. So yeah, that's what an EL34 sounds like with this primary impedance on the output transformer, with this plate voltage, with this negative feedback set up into uh, these pre-roll uh, uh, selections you know, in this room. That's all these other factors that interact with the EL34. In general, you could, I could make an amp set with either output tube and a very small percentage of players could tell which was which um, in general. Now, there are cases where you might find some really great sounding old Siemens or he 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 or, uh, or Amperex or whatever where the, the difference can be a little more exaggerated. But um, they're not, you know, Marshall chose the 34s because it was a commonly available tube in the UK that was equivalent in most aspects to a 6L6. 
Fender never did anything with the L34s because why? That was a British tube. They would have to import them. They could get GE in Sylvania, et cetera, 6L6s. Um, so the, the tubes are not that different from each other. They are different. And they have some different responses. And in certain applications, you might hear more of a difference between them. You know, uh, how do they react with a, a cathode follower uh, before preceding them? You know, uh, and like a more of an MPEG circuit. How are they? How would they work single-ended? Is going to be different. But in, in how most guitar amps are used, there's a lot of baggage from the amps that they were first heard it with that's associated with that tube. So people have a perception of a tube, which is not always not always uh, really what's happening within the tube. Now, a 34 does have a different mid-range response than 606, which has a little, t typically can have a little more high end, and a designer can bring that out, or a, binder, a designer can work against that. Um, choose the designer, not the tubes. And if you like the way it sounds and, and plays, you're right. Hey, Johnny Watkins, uh, series with the, all right, 60 B send. All right. I can't spend too much on this because it's time to take another break and I need to, I need to take a leak. But, uh, um, first of all, there are three nominal levels, three nominal levels. Hey, I'll do it this way. It makes more sense on video. Three nominal levels that signals operate at. There's plus four, which is a balanced signal. You're not going to run into that in guitar amps. That's called pro level, plus four balance. You'd find that in studio gear. There's negative 10 unbalanced. That's line level. And that's pretty much what a, a preamp out of a, of a guitar amp is designed to be unless it specifically has uh, an attenuated setting for pedals. So negative 10 unbalanced is equivalent to plus four balanced as far as being a professional or a line level, which is a hot signal. And then there's negative 30 dB unbalanced, which is what's called instrument level. So if I plug a, 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 my Strat into, into something, the line level there is nominally negative 30. So if I go into an old analog delay pedal designed for that, it's going to be fine with that. So uh, old analog delay is going to be fine with negative 30 as an input. If I were to run a negative 10 input into that analog delay, it's going to distort to hell. Similarly, if I run something designed for, for line level with an instrument level signal, the signal noise ratio is going to be off, so it's going to be hissy. Um, it gets really deep. You want to match all these things. A lot of modern delay pedals you can calibrate to work at either level. Some amps you can switch between um, negative 10 and negative 30 and when you switch it attenuates the send and then it amplifies the return other amps you've got to dial it in um, but my back teeth are swimming and I, I covered this quite a bit in that uh, interview I did uh, last month with um, a vertex effects so we're gonna take another top uh, quick break seven minutes Cornford Mark 50H is an excellent amp, so I'm sure that Cornford uh, has got an owner's manual out there that tells you more about how that effects loop was designed to be used, and um, maybe we'll come back to this in a little bit. So let's see, where's my magic button? All right, we're going to take another seven-minute intermission. See you guys in a little bit.
Now we can all be chill. Chill is good. Let's see where we were. Matt Scott, uh, I've, I'm trying to get caught up. I'll, I'll get with you. Um, I just don't want to take a bunch of stuff in and have it sit here for two months before I even get a chance to look at it because that does not make anyone happy. The 65 Deluxe Reverb reissue in stock form usually sounds very good while everything is working well. Many of the changes I make to that are to keep it working well, moving the stuff that gets hot off the PCB, putting in filter caps that someone would choose to use. Um, the only downside to the stock one, as it comes from the factory, if it's biased correctly, is that the vibrato channel is a little bit noisier than it should be just due to how a trace was run was run and it has a 47 picofarad bright cap which can be a little bit harsh all that said most stock 65 deluxe reverb reissues come with a c12k speaker which is just the worst possible choice for that app so before you have the amp modded for a sound change modding for reliability is one thing but before you worry about making any changes you can remove that bright cap yourself it's easy. You can just snip it, just one end of it. Um, the uh, speaker sucks. So play, uh, odds are you can find someone with some different speakers to try the amp through, and it'll transform the sound of the amp. That amp sounds much better with, through almost anything else on the planet than it does through the C12K. Let's see. Brad is here. Uh, I am trying to c play catch up on questions, so if people could hold up on questions until I get more caught up, um, I might be able to answer them. Um, yeah, well, I mean, well, Tasty Tone, thank you. I'm not making radical changes to the 65 Deluxe Reaper Brie issue. You know, the, I'm making it sound better, but they're mostly fairly incremental changes that add up. The biggest contributor is going to be just getting the hiss out of the vibrato channel by running a shielded wire where they have the uh, the trace and then the additional mids pod, if you do that, is really uh, makes, adds a lot of flexibility. But just having it so the board's not going to catch on fire and those crappy caps aren't going to... You know, long before they leak or, or, or hum, they're... they're uh, preventing the amp from sounding as good as it could because those those IC brown caps are bad. And like I said, that, that speaker has got to be changed out. Well, here's an interesting thing for you. Uh, tomorrow, I believe, I'm going to be able to do um, those Joe Recibo clips that you just heard, you've heard throughout this broadcast. I've got a 66 Deluxe Reverb here, 65 Deluxe Reverb here, and two 68 Customs that I've, I've made into real boys. And you're going to get to hear the same part, play through the same uh, amps, through the same speaker. The uh, only difference will be uh, tubes, though they're all biased about the same, about 55% uh, 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 idle uh, dissipation. So uh, people can make informed decisions. I have found that there are differences between two 65 deluxe reverbs will sound slightly different from each other. Overall though, most people would be hard pressed to tell the difference between the three comparable amps. But judge for yourself when you see that video. Um, on that note, <coughs> pardon me, when doing voiceover one should never drink coffee, just water only, but I, I like coffee too much so occasionally I get uh, the dry coughs. But you might have noticed that in the last couple of weeks, all the videos I've, I've been putting up have been in, uploaded in 4K. That's not so you can, uh, you know, there's no, there are no stunning visuals in this, though I do want you to see everything clearly. You see everything just as clearly at um, HD as you do in 4K, so 1080 versus uh, the full 4K. But YouTube uses a different compression algorithm for 4K stuff than they do for the for the 1080 and below. And so to get the audio to you guys at a place where you could really hear differences, I have to do the, the 4K upload so it doesn't compress the audio as much. I discovered that after I did that um, 
video showing how changing the, the tubes in a deluxe reverb changes the gain response. And in the room and in the recording I did, those responses were very audible. But because I did that at 1080, YouTube's compression kind of undid some of those changes. It was really hard to hear in that. Thanks, YouTube. So uh, you're almost always going to be getting 4K from this point forward until later when I just got to probably have to spend a ton of money and go to 8K as, as things change. But we should be good now f for a good long while at 4K. Uh, that said, Wes, yeah, I mean, given my choice, I'd get a 67 over a, over a reissue as well. But a lot of that is through this what speaker. That C12K really does the, the reissue a disservice. Uh, 60s fenders, um, pretty much, you know, yeah. chapter and verse here endeth the lesson. When you know, they will not last forever without work, but they can be kept going for practically forever, and they will sound good for practically forever. Um, Ampegs very problematic. Gibson's very problematic. Valco, National, Supro, anyone's bet. Marshalls can uh, be in that quality with fenders, but they're going to need more work. Um, Voxes can be kept going. They cost a lot more to keep going than a fender. Um, but, you know, if someone to say, hey, what is, what what forever app? You know, go get a, a Princeton Reverb or a Deluxe Reverb or a Super Reverb or a Vibrolux and keep it going. Have have good maintenance done on it every 10, 15 years. It's just going to keep going and going and going. And there's just not much wrong that can go much that can go wrong with them. Now, if you never change the filter caps, you might lose a power transformer. If you never uh, have your tubes checked out, you might lose an output transformer. That happens. That's due to catastrophic failure because someone did not have basic maintenance done because they wanted to keep it vintage. So by keeping the amp vintage, they killed their vintage transformers. Leo came from repair and service background. That's Leo's whole approach to building an amp was building an amp that could be serviced because Leo expected you to service the amp. Have it serviced. If you want a vintage transformer, have new caps. By caps, I mean the filter caps, electrolytic. The old film caps can usually stay in place for forever. Hey, Shelby. Yeah, when you have an old Ampeg, like a V2 or V4, you got to look out for the dropping resistors and diodes, which often burn the boards. And a lot of those things are running uh, the bias wrong, and a lot of those are putting way too much voltage on the screens for the tubes that are in there. Um, so you can have very short output tube life with an old V2 or V4 at the stock voltages. A lot of times on those, I will decrease the screen voltage at the tubes using some Zener diodes, sometimes by as much as like 40 volts. Uh, just you know, look at the data sheet of the tubes you're using. What is the screen max? Don't exceed that too much. You can keep the plate way the hell up there if the bias is good. You can so you can have it biased properly with a really high plate voltage. Just limit the screens, and, and it'll last longer. Ampegs sound fantastic. They always have weird, weird, bad decisions in them that um, if they hadn't sounded so good, no one would ever put up with them. By the way, they can still sound great after all the what-the-fuck stuff has been addressed. And you can have it with a very sane performance and still have it sound great. It's not like a trade-off between that sucks but it sounds good or this should be good but it doesn't quite sound as good. You can have both, just not in stock form. Let's see. Uh, I don't know that this is the case with your 6505 plus uh, subpar number. But a lot of the 6505s and 5150s, they have a, uh, a transistor used for muting. So that at the moment of, ch it's supposed to, how it's supposed to work is that at the moment that you switch channels, it mutes every the output so you don't have a pop through the output. If that transistor goes bad, or if the voltage supply that feeds that transistor goes bad, and both 
one or both can happen in those, then the output can be muted. And sometimes it'll randomly mute as things get warm or cold. Um, you may be a 75 cent transistor away from a working amp. I can't promise you that. Uh, but that's the most common uh, thing for a, 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 uh, an issue like yours that you're describing um, in general. Uh, without measuring the voltages in your amp, I can't tell you more than that, though. You could also just have one bad uh, preamp tube that's just slightly loose or something. Hey, Devin. Um, I don't think that's betraying my values. What ample amp is terrible to maintain that I still love at any price point? Ampeg SVT. Hideously expensive to keep going. Uh, the potential for catastrophic failure is there if you don't. You need to do a lot of preventative maintenance. maintenance. Uh, the tubes are hideously expensive. And uh, if you're lucky enough to have a 69 through 76... There's one price level, but even if you have what most people have and have like a, a the, the 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 classic or the later heritage ones, there's every little thing wants to go wrong on that. Uh, so if you're using it in the studio and it never moves, you're gonna be fine. But if you try to go on tour with one, uh, you know, and you, you need to have at least two on tour, preferably more. You're gonna need to have spare tubes at you know six hundred dollars a set. And you're not. You're going to need to have a list of good texts in every town on your itinerary to keep that thing going. But for some people, the sound of an SVT is worth it. I personally think that they should be reserved for studio or home use and never moved. Um, you know, um, and reserved kind of for special cases. Uh, flip side of that, uh, get an old B15. Beautiful, beautiful sound without all the problems. Of course, not loud enough for most live gigs. Hey, Vanguard, appreciate that. Very general thoughts about level of quality of Milkman and Dr. Zim, Dr. Z Creamer and Z Rec. Um, I have no experience with or opinion of the Milkman. I would I look forward to getting one in, but until that day comes, I don't have an opinion. Uh, the Z Rec is a good amp. Most Dr. Zs are good amps. They're overbuilt, which makes the service unnecessarily expensive when it happens. They're underbuilt in, in that they don't have tooth locking washers, tooth washers on the input jacks, output jacks, or pots. And that can be problematic. And that's mostly due to the fact that they use very thick uh, acrylic panels with uh, alpha pots, and the bushings just aren't long enough to accommodate. Um, uh, the, the, the locking wash the, Z, the tooth washers so you have to make sure that the, all those things are tight and there's no tooth washer to help that and uh, the reverb models are problematic but the, the Z-Rec does not have reverb so it's, it's a good amp uh, not all the, the, the reverb models are bad the Mark II's are infinitely better than the Mark I's um, the Mark II reverb
So I've been talking this whole time with no... Motherfucker. How did that happen? Oh, I know how it happened. Shit. God damn. All right, let me go. Son of a bitch. Hey, Devin Walters. Thank you so much. All right. Let me s- Thank you so much. Uh, you gave me 20 bucks to tell me the audio is out. Um, I feel like I owe you. Shit. Hey, Baron. Yeah. Can everyone hear me now? Fuck. Fuck. I had to, I, to make the modem work, I had unplugged a USB connector. And that USB connector is also connected to my Motu M2. And I didn't realize that it was going to shut off the, the, the live status of this microphone. So, hell. Um, anyway, um, yeah, I'll get to the Mesa series resistor again. Uh, uh, if, if, you, if you don't use an app very often, plug it on every once a month for a few hours at least just to keep uh, the electrolytics wet. You know, sit down and play some cowboy chords while watching TV, whatever. You can keep the volume low. Just run some power into it for a few hours once a month at least it really will help things last longer and turn all the pots so you know a layer of dust doesn't build up and they get frozen or scratchy um avoid the johnson millennium amps they're 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 junk um shit that pisses me off i'm just so tired of issues and the mesa series resistor questions are the the series resistors and mesas are just dumb it's not cost saving it's not intelligent, you know. So you get ten one watt resistors, uh, any one of which can be affected by humidity and drift and fail. In which case, then either um, uh, you lose the thing completely, or uh, then it, it shorts as a you know, fails as a short, and then you've got a nine watt string of resistors, but you've got nine point five watts on it. Just do what anyone else would do: use a single ten or fifteen or twenty watt rated um uh, uh, uh resistor you know power resistor a metal oxide up in the air away from things so that nothing gets hot like anyone sane would do don't use a whole bunch of cheap ass carbon comps in a string right up against a board that's just it's so bad it's it's just it's mason in a nutshell what's the dumbest most expensive thing we could do and then we'll call it mojo Hey, Wes, uh, zucchini bread is the only suitable use for zucchini in the world other than for scaring cats. I cannot stand the, the flavor or texture of zucchini, but zucchini bread is an excellent thing. It just um, it bothers me knowing that all the time and effort to make zucchini bread, you could also have made carrot c- uh, cake, which is much better, or banana bread. Yeah. All right. So, all right. Let's do another 15 minutes if anyone's still here. Can you still see me and hear me? Uh, I don't know what's going on. Uh, I had to unplug the uh, USB connection, which goes to the USB uh, expander, which is connected uh, to the to the um, the LAN because I can't stream this stuff on the Wi-Fi. It doesn't have the bandwidth. I have to have the wire connection. And that made uh, my logic input go from record to nothing, which muted the audio. And I was, I was so ec- ecstatic to say it, be, have it say live again and to have everything. I didn't even notice that because I can't hear myself self while doing this. Um, and if I were to turn the audio on, it'd be 30 seconds after I say anything. It'd drive me to distraction. I need a producer. Um, so maybe uh, I need to have someone volunteer to text me when that shit happens so I can have the phone up and see the text even if I don't hear it. Uh, uh, Nikki already is kind enough to occasionally bring me coffee. I'm not going to conscript her to sit here and listen to me babble for three hours. Uh, Victor eats carrot cake for the icing. 
Carrot cake should never have icing or frosting. That cream cheese stuff is bullshit. I like a nice orange glaze with orange, some sugar, some orange peel, and some kind of good liqueur or brandy or something, and you just heat all that up. Maybe take some marmalade, which has got the peel in it, and heat that up with some brandy or rum, and then drizzle that all over the carrot cake so it soaks in. That's so much better than cream cheese frosting. 150 people. All right. Well, we have sound and vision. Um, uh, man, it, I, I don't know that I'm sharing wisdom. I'm sharing bitter experience and a jaundiced point of view, uh, which maybe that can uh, be, be confused for um, wisdom these days. Man, Brad, your channel is, is picking up. Uh, uh, you, 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 Brad has just stepped up his audio and visual stuff so much in the last couple of weeks, and you know it's he's always had the content. I've just been on the boys' ass saying you have such great information. Make people see it and hear it, so they'll take you seriously to begin with, and they won't spend as much time arguing with you because you're badly uh, lit uh, with with crappy audio. It's just a thing. People take good stuff seriously and aren't going to listen. Through any obstacles, you know, said the guy who just for ten minutes. But you know, dress for the part, dress for the job you want. And Brad has always had the the the, the mind and the experience and and the and the communication. But now it looks and sounds it. And uh, you know, so if you haven't checked out Brad's channel in a while, Brad's Guitar Garage, he's stepping it up in an awesome way. Man, I'm always ready for another vacation, uh, Wes. I, I go to London tomorrow. I would go to D.C. again tomorrow. Um, I have no interest in L.A., though if I do, I will certainly hook you up, uh, hit you up. But um, you know, I like history, and so L.A. is a bit iffy. You know, there's the Getty, and then there's... There's the Getty. Uh, uh, Charlie, I, I, I just don't like the, the texture of zucchini, uh, zucchini or any other squash. It's, it triggers a, a gag reflex in me. I'm sorry. I don't want to be graphic. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I literally cannot swallow this stuff unless it's ground up very finely and put into zucchini bread. Of course, my mother made me grow up with boiled yellow squash and onion until it was just this sludgy, slimy yuckiness. And she'd say, you have to eat every bit before you can leave the table. And every bite made me want to puke. Um, I, I, no one reported to child services. This was a long time ago. The statute of limitations has long expired. But I don't do that to my kids. Oh, man, Nick Romy. Yeah, it's, that's too big a topic today. Inductor-based graphic EQs are really tricky because you have to deal with inductance. Uh, and, uh, is, you know, most stuff in amplifiers is just capacitors. So you're just doing the C CR stuff. But when you get into inductors, you have LCR stuff. And this variable affects that variable. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking myself up to a point to discuss how tone circuits work in, in guitars, which is enough of an LCR thing, but once you get into active stuff, and then you gotta look at inductors versus op amps behaving as inductors. Um, Brad might be actually be a better person to talk about that than I am, because Brad, Brad keeps his solid state knowledge up uh, to speed, and I, I dredge it up as needed because I prefer not to work on solid state stuff. So there are things I know that I don't put into practice every day that Brad and, and Six and other guys who do a lot of solid stuff, state stuff, they, they, they've got the vocabulary fresh. Let's see. Um, Devin, I hate to tell you that it doesn't matter if it's 1997, any hot rod deluxe is, is at best a ticking time bomb, if not already damaged, uh, beyond, uh, reasonable hope of, of recovery. But sometimes we get lucky. Uh, if you've not recapped it, 
odds are you already have some pretty pretty big heat damage in the area of the five watt um, resistors and zener diodes. Uh, yeah, and odds are more one or more of your twenty two nanofarad caps are are probably either leaking or on the verge of it. Not twenty two nanofarad, twenty two microfarad, the filter caps. So you know, and odds are you probably have some. The beginnings of some broken solder joints on input jacks and, and and volume pots and 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 tone pots. It's worth doing the maintenance on. Um, I don't know whether you should do that. If you've replaced tubes and never recapped, I would trouble with all the hot rods and all the blues juniors and all the blues deluxes is that the typical repair to keep them going for for more than the two, uh, five years most people get out of them before they begin to have really horrible problems, is it costs three, you know, between three and $400. That's an awful lot of money to put into an amp to undo bad, cheap decisions made by Fender in the begin with. They, if, they had, if they had a sane low voltage supply, if they used higher quality filter caps, that'd be three, $400 that they would never, the owner would never need to spend. So I... I th- I, th- I think it's a punitive tax that Fender imposes on you. You just don't know that you're getting going to get that bill down the road. I'm not a big fan of okra either. I'll, I'll, I'll do okra as a thickener in a gumbo, but I can't eat okra in any other form, especially boiled. But I don't even like it fried. Peter, if your question got lost, I apologize. Just... Ask it again. I will. I will answer it before the end of the, the day, before the end of the broadcast. We're going to go about another ten minutes, and I will try to get through all of them. Um, while I, I've not given up as and then I can't do it, I have given up as in if I go any farther, it's just going to cost more than the amp is worth. That was early. Now I'll typically know ahead of time that no, this is not going to be a cost-effective thing. This is not a good use of someone's funds. But um, uh, but uh, there are t- times when I say this is as good as we can reasonably get this to go like some old Ampeg SVT four pros and stuff. But this is going to work and it's going to be usable. But to make this thing perfect, it's cheaper to buy something new. I I would sell them to someone while the Johnsons are still working. So. Go go on the internet and sell your Johnson. Someone will enjoy it, um, but right now, if they're working and they sound good, they're salable. You can use that to buy to turn into something maybe closer to your dream app or something that's going to be around in ten years. I I I I think I would be more into good food because I would have. Uh, 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 taste buds that were never scarred by zucchini and, and squash. Happy Father's Day to all of you in Australia. Greg Hill, I'm not a big fan of uh, dwell pots on... Um, on standard Fender reverb amps. It's one thing if you have the big standalone reverb unit, which has got a 6K6 or a 6V6 or an EL84 as the driver. Um, you can get away with things like dwell pots, so I think it's still an overblown thing, but uh, most Fender amps are just driving with an AT7. You, you dwell is a lot to ask of that circuit, and it's not really necessary. Um, a better mod for a Fender reverb amp is just to use the audio taper 100K for the reverb pot rather than uh, linear. Exactly, Brad. Exactly. Oh, yeah, Nick. Nick, I told you, space. I love Texas pickled okra, the hot pickled okra. That's great. It is crunchy like a like a like a uh, a cucumber pickle. I love that. Uh, I, I have a pool party, get uh, have a whole bunch of stuff up and uh, out, and 
cold things and spicy things and crunchy things. And I I love a good hot pickled okra. Give me give me a a, a, a cheeseburger or hot dog off the grill and some some Fritos and some pickled okra. Uh, maybe some chow chow. I even eat kimchi with that shit. But uh, pickled okra is a different thing entirely than okra. You know, cooked okra. Seventies basement fifty speaker are using it for guitar or bass. EVs are, are an awfully heavy speaker to put into an old Fender baffle. I found that Fender baffles don't usually hold up well to EVs or JBLs. Um, it depends on your price point, uh, and you can't just say Jensen two by ten because Jensen makes a lot of different speakers. I, I'd have to know. Um, what sounds you're going for you know like i said at the beginning of the broadcast or what's your ideal sound it's going to be different for the guy who wants to have that sparkling clean riviera paradise versus the uh talk to your daughter kinds of cleans hey jaska usually i would look for a bad tube followed by a uh, a, a bad uh, solder joint in that order but start with the tubes because that's always the cheapest easiest thing to fix but without having your amp in front of me I can't say uh, Joe uh, v- before resales because they're very heavy uh, very loud and very expensive to maintain they sound cool but unless you are in fact Keith Richards uh, playing Dodger Stadium they might be too much for your average gig and he had someone to carry them for him. Should not be a problem, Ryan B. Let's see. All right, I'm not seeing... Wiley C. Coyote, um, I don't know what an STR-78 is. And uh, if you want a bigger Swart, S- oh, uh, STR keeps coming up, a Swart, STR Reaver. Uh, a bigger Swart would typically be getting to a deluxe reverb kind of thing. I almost banned Brad by mistake. I think it's about time to wrap this up. Uh, man, nothing just takes the wind out of my sails rather, more than losing the internet and then ha- having the, the sound off when I think it's on. Someday I'll get really good at this and you'll be here to laugh at me until that day comes. And I appreciate you guys being here to laugh at me until that day comes. Um, you know, it helps me keep from keep, you know, helps keep me from taking myself too seriously, which is always a, a very important thing. Yeah, you stir fry the zucchini, you get it just so, and then you scrape it in the garbage and you make some food. That's the way you do it. Big, big trend in Chinese restaurants lately to put zucchini in their food, and it just really lessens my enjoyment uh, of the whole thing. So uh, thank you all for being here, despite the, the hurdles and uh, 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 little, little fuck-ups on my end. and and the internet gods frowning down upon me. Uh, I look forward to seeing you guys on the channel. And it's thank you for being here on your Saturday. Everyone enjoy your weekend, and we will see you guys next time.